test, test.
All right, I'd like to uh, call to uh, call to order the Reynoldsburg City Council meeting for November 8th, 2021 uh, at 631. Uh, I'm Council Member Leo Savati acting as the president for this evening's meeting. President Jenkins and President Pro Temp Bryant are both unable to attend tonight's meeting. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone to the Reynoldsburg Council Chambers. Uh, now we would like to stand for the uh, invocation and welcome Pastor Aaron DeLong of the Simple Church who will give the invocation. Following the invocation, please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for tonight. Uh, I have no idea what's on the agenda tonight, but I know you do. And uh, tonight we just put all of the, the items that are, that are up for discussion in your hands. We ask you to be with us tonight. And uh, Lord, we know... From your word that says that if we would ask for wisdom, you'll give it to us. And so tonight I just ask for wisdom for every single one of the council members, uh, for our mayor, for everybody that's involved in deciding uh, the direction of our city, Lord. And wisdom to know what to say yes to, what to say no to, what to take action on, what to table. Lord, give us wisdom uh, in your wisdom, not a wisdom that comes from what we understand, a wisdom that's beyond us, a supernatural wisdom. Uh, Lord, and I just pray that that wisdom flows over into the decisions we make, the actions or the attitudes we have, and even, um, even the way we, we engage tonight uh, with one another. Lord, we love you and we thank you and we ask your presence to be with us tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Republic for which we stand. Thank you. 
Get it. All right, would the Kirk clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Peckerall? Yes. Councilmember Lawson Rowe? Here. Councilmember Cotner? Here. Councilmember Baker? Here. Councilmember Bryant? Councilmember Strickland? Present. Acting President Salvati? Here. All right, next on the agenda is approval of the agenda. Um, are there any additions or corrections to the agenda? Right. Seeing none, the agenda stands approved as corrected. Right. Uh, approval of the City Council regular meeting minutes for October 25th, 2021. Are there any additions, deletions, or corrections? All right, seeing none, the minutes stand approved as submitted. Community comments. The community comments portion of the meeting is an opportunity for citizens to address council. Citizens may bring matters to the attention of city council or discuss items on the agenda with the exception of legislation scheduled for a public hearing. <clears throat> comments related to public hearing may only be made during the public hearing portion of the meeting. Before addressing city council members uh, uh, of the public, are asked to complete a speaker's form and give it to the clerk. The council president will invite speakers to step to the microphone and give their name and address. All remarks should be addressed to the council as a whole and not to exceed three minutes. Do we have any comments from the public? No, sir, I did not receive any. I do have one email comment though. This is from Mary Ann Shank at 50 Wickfield Road. Honorable Mayor and City Council members, I am writing to convey my opposition to the proposed water rate increase to be considered by City Council this evening as an ordinance to amend Chapter 953 of the Water Rate Charges, Section 953.01a. While I understand the City of Columbus is again increasing the cost of water to the City of Reynoldsburg, I have the following concerns. One, the City of Reynoldsburg does not offer a discounted water sewer rate for low-income or senior citizens as the City of Columbus does to offset the impact of these high rates. Before adopting yet another rate increase, please fully investigate options to reduce the impact of the already high water rates on low income and senior citizens such as myself. It is already difficult to maintain my home given the extreme financial burden I experienced during the pandemic and increased utility costs will only add to that burden. Two, this ordinance is scheduled to be adopted as an emergency. It is not clear from the information included in the City Council agenda packet why an emergency exists, but the cover memo alludes to the need to have new rates in place by January 1, 2022. When did the City of Columbus advise that the water rates for suburbs would increase? Why doesn't the City of Reynoldsburg provide for sufficient public notice and comment on such an increase? The appearance is that the emergency clause is used to subvert public comment. I am sure your true intention is to be transparent and to allow the public adequate time to consider and comment. Costs are rising from all fronts. I hope the City Council will be mindful of the total impact the government has on residents' pocketbooks. With rising home prices, I expect my assessed valuation and hence property taxes to continue to rise. I understand the water sewer program is operated as an enterprise. However, my pocketbook is limited. Overlapping government governments also are keen to dip further into my limited pocketbook by the recent expensive and poorly publicized school district levy campaign. And while I understand City Council cannot control those overlapping government, please be respectful of the impact each and every decision costs those of us on limited incomes. I hope you will de consider delaying action on the proposed water rate increase until such time as the above mentioned concerns can be addressed. I apologize for weighing in the day this matter is to be considered, but I only heard about it on the local news today and am unable to attend the city council meeting this evening. I hope you will respect my perspective as I hope to be able to maintain my home in Reynoldsburg for the remainder of my given days. Council President, there are no further um, comments. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> are there any initial comments from any of council? Okay, from the mayor. Uh, yes, President, uh, <clears throat> Temporary President Salvati, one moment. 
I have a proclamation that I would like to read for you, but I can't do it alone, uh, as what you will find out is this group uh, from Joseph Cote. Uh, they don't do anything alone. They all work together uh, to meet the needs of the community. So if I could ask the members of Joseph Cote that are here in attendance to come on down with me, please. So the people you have behind you are uh, volunteers for an organization of Joseph Coates that is in Reynoldsburg, though slightly in an odd way. Uh, but they need to be uh, recognized for their accomplishments uh, that they have put forth uh, for many, many years. Whereas Joseph's Coat was founded in 1998 to meet the needs of homeless families and was hosted through the Interfaith Hospitality Network. And whereas the mission of Joseph's Coat is answering God's call to love and serve neighbors by providing clothing, household goods, and furniture to those in need. And whereas founder Joanne uh, Barrett began Joseph's Coat in a two-car garage, and although Joanne is no longer in leadership, she still continues today as a faithful volunteer. And whereas since 1998, Joseph's Coat have, has moved twice before finding its current location at 240 Outer Belt Street, where they have been for 10 years. And whereas originally just distributing clothing, Joseph's Coat has since expanded to include furniture and household goods to provide stabilizing resources to families transitioning from homelessness to permanent housing. And whereas the original ministry was support, uh, supported by a host of volunteers from Reynoldsburg's Messiah Lutheran and St. Pius uh, the Catholic Church, neighboring uh, churches on Wagner Road. Today's partners include Unity, Parkview Presbyterian, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton Parish, Peace United Methodist, East Point Christian, Epiphany Lutheran, Holy Spirit Catholic, and in Gehenna, the Peace Lutheran and St. Matthew's Catholic. And whereas Joseph's Coat has recorded more than 1,800 trips, providing assistance to more than 800 families and children, and distributed more than 51,000 pieces of cloth clothing, household goods, and furniture in 2021. Now, therefore, I, Joe Begany, Mayor of the City of Reynoldsburg, Ohio, hereby heartily commend Joseph's Code on their 20 years of service to our community, here unto sign this day. Thank you on behalf of many, many others that are out there for all of your service to the people of Reynoldsburg and beyond. Thank you. They look wonderful without me. Uh-oh. <laughs> Hop in there. Let me take your picture. Okay. I was kind enough to be invited down last week uh, at a celebration of the volunteers that were in uh, that position. Uh, and again, what an amazing thing that they're able to do. Uh, I do have a couple of other notes of interest. Um, as we all know, we've been following uh, the federal level legislation for uh, the uh, infrastructure project. Um, today was a day spent finding out exactly what may or may not be coming our way in the not too distant future. So I do have a couple of items to list here as far as approximate funding. Uh, it's nothing specific to the city of Reynoldsburg yet. However, uh, this is what will be coming to the state of Ohio specifically. 9.2 billion for Ohio's roads and highways, approximately 500 million to assist with bridge repairs and 12.5 billion available in competitive grants, at least 100 million to expand broadband to unreached areas of the state. 1.4 billion for water uh, infrastructure, 1.2 trillion for public transportation, 253 million for airport improvements, 140 million for the construction of electric vehicle charging network throughout the state, and 1 billion for the Great Lake Restoration Initiative to decrease pollution, prevent invasive species, and mitigate erosion and rising lake levels. Now, while all of these things will not apply specifically to Reynoldsburg, a number of them do, and what we have been spending today uh, learning is how this money will be allocated and the process for grant applications. So needless to say, we'll be very busy over the next coming uh, months as we find ways to maximize the taxpayers' dollars to bring some of those funds to Reynoldsburg to improve in all of those kind of categories. 
Uh, I would also like to let you know that at the next meeting, we will uh, most likely have an announcement as far as our new development director. We're just finalizing some details, but we will have that person involved uh, at the next meeting on November 22nd. Uh, so you can meet him and uh, learn a little bit about him. And with that, I'll just have to leave the rest of it in mystery as we're finally, you know, dotting the I's and crossing the T's for that particular item. Uh, so again, thank you very much for your time. I return to you, President Salvati. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda, I have a presentation by the auditor and the tax administrator, Gishel. President Silvati and members of council, uh, as a result of the global pandemic, many of our top payees are changing their business model. They're allowing employees to work from home. My team has been running very complex financial forecasts and we've determined that this change is going to have a severe negative impact on our income tax revenue. Our forecast uh, will be presented by Laura Gishel who has 25 years worth of experience in municipal tax. She's presented to the Ohio legislator. She's ran the RITA office in Worthington and worked for the state auditor. As council and the mayor begin to review your 2020 budget, please consider the factors that are being presented tonight. And with that, I will present Lori Gishel. Thank you, Mr. Sasak, and um, thank you, council, for allowing us to be here this evening. So as uh, Auditor Sisak mentioned, um, we have come into some times that are really uncharted for all of Ohio municipalities. Um, the COVID um, pandemic has made changes, as you know, with business, and those businesses are now making changes to their models with uh, permanent shifts to either work from home or some type of hybrid model work from home. Um, so what I'd like to share with you is how that is now going to impact, how we believe that's going to impact our tax dollars. On slide one there that you have, um, actually it's marked slide two, the first uh, title page is one. Um, you can see here our yearly gross uh, dollar distribution in comparison through the end of September. And I believe you get regular updates from the auditor as well as um, the mayor. Um, you know that we've been, um, the trend is quite well so far this year. So the total that we've received is close to $2.7 million. Um, that chart is showing you that um, while it's an upward trend, mainly the withholding portion is driving that. Withholding out of the tax dollars that the businesses collect from their employees and then remit to us. We monitor these regu regularly to determine anomalies, um, if the revenue is subject to refund and the like. Um, I will tell you our September and August numbers were up. We were able to go back, pinpoint those two certain businesses, and we know that 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 upward tick was due to bonuses that aren't normally paid um, as well as other incentives. What does that tell us? Those, those revenues are subject to refund because of this change of work from home for 2021. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, so what else does this chart tell us? The majority, 80 plus percent of our tax Revenue comes from employer withholding. While this withholding may include res courtesy resident withholding, we also know that only three to four million dollars of our total tax revenue is generated by our residents. The majority of our money of the tax revenue comes from employees that come into Reynoldsburg to work but live elsewhere. And we'll talk about that portion here in a little bit. The next slide, the tax portion of the general fund. I just want to bring this to your attention. Um, while the tax revenue goes into multiple funds, the general fund, the income tax fund, the debt retirement fund, and the capital improvement fund, according to our ordinance uh, 0419, we want to draw your attention to the fact that our income tax um, revenue is the major source of funding 
80 plus percent of our general fund. That's not unusual as most municipalities typically report 65 plus percent of their tax revenues go to the general fund. However, much like the other municipalities, we're expecting changes to come. Uh, for tax year 2020, Governor DeWine's emergency orders allowed for individuals to work from home, um, but for local tax to be withheld to the principal place of employment. That was during the pandemic. As you know, it extended and extended. Um, while there are st still court cases pending on this issue for tax year 2020, we do not expect a large amount of refunds at this time. However, Rita, um, assisting us with that income tax collection, they are um, accepting those requests and they are holding them until such time that the court cases are decided. What we really want to focus on today is more of the 2021 and 2022 what's to come. So on slide four, what's on the horizon? Two key tax revenue influences. The first is the potential for 2021 remote work location refund request. That stems from House Bill 110, where our legislators to try to give a quick direction to both the municipalities and the businesses of Ohio, came out and said employers withholding to the primary workplace um, could, may, they may withhold to the primary workplace for 2021. However, it would also give employees the option to request a, re a refund at the end of this year if they're working from home. We've been working with our large employers to determine what percentage could we expect for refunds. Um, and those refunds will be coming in starting in January of 22. We expect an influx then, um, and however, there is a three-year statutory limitation on any refund requests. So if they don't request it in 22, they still have time to do that. The second piece of this is the employers permanently shifting to a work-from-home or a hybrid method. Um, I don't know where all of you work, but maybe you work from home during the pandemic, maybe now you go into the office a couple days a week or one day a week. Um, this is what we're seeing. Employers are now making those decisions. Um, do we still want to maintain a brick and mortar or do we want to allow our employees to work from home and are we as productive and is there cost savings there? So let's address for planning, planning and budget purposes. Um, we've been in in contact with some of our large employers to determine um, these two amounts as far as the key impact, the two impacts, key impacts. Um, let's address the second piece first, which is going forward, what are their business plans going to look like and how much can we expect to lose if those, those individuals that have been coming into the city to work are now working elsewhere. At, at their homes. On slide five, you have the uh, tax collection comparison. We were able to get in contact with 11 of our 20 top employers. This chart here shows you that um, their revenue just from those 11 from 2017 through 2021. We're projecting 2022. We did keep take into account that over time from 19 to 21, there was a 13% increase. Why did we do that? Because the numbers that I'm about to share with you are based on 2019 tax year. The reason for that is that's our last full tax year. The 2020 tax year due April 21 is still not completely processed and closed because of extensions through October the 15th of this year. So we're using that um, and those percentages uh, to apply. Um, from the data we received from those 11 employers, we determined that approximately 79% of their employees have the ability to work from home as of today. In addition, these same employers are going to be withholding to workplace location beginning January 1. They have already started the process of having their payroll systems changed. What does that mean? 
those individuals that, again, that would come here to work are now maybe working at their home in Columbus and Worthington, um, wherever, and they, that employer is now going to start, as of January 1, withholding that money to Columbus, Worthington, wherever those, that person lives. Um, we're gonna, we made some assumptions, but um, let's go on um, to slide six. What's the timeline for this? January 1, those employers are going to make, start making changes. Not all of them, but we, we, we project that the, the larger employers, we've talked to enough of them, other cities around the state um, that we work with, they've talked to several of their larger employers, and most of the larger employers are making the change and trying to make that change within the first quarter of 22. We won't see it that early. Um, there's a delay, a little bit of a delay with Rita. Also with the employers, they are large employers, file twice a month. Um, so we will start to realize the revenue decrease as early as February 1st. The second part of that um, is the refund piece, and that we will begin to realize, we believe, in by July, August, uh, basically the end of the second, third quarter um, from those refunds coming in. We have 90 days to process any refund request. So the reason I share this with you is because, again, we're in uncharted waters here, so it's, it's new for all of us, and we're trying to keep... Um, good tabs on the data, what we're seeing, where we're going, um, so that we can keep you informed. Um, and we will probably need to do that over the next uh, three months, six months, um, and year as, we, as all of this kind of sorts itself out. So on slide seven, these are the numbers. Um, unfortunately, they don't, they don't look so pretty, but um, I was happy to hear the mayor say that we may be getting some additional federal money coming in, so hopefully that will help. Once again, it's based on 2019 revenues, tax revenues. The first line there, it shows all of the revenue was 20, just over $26 million. We first took out the withholding portion of that, which makes up the lion's share of our um, revenue, $21 million. From there, we removed what we received in 2019 from withholding from Reynoldsburg residents. That's not, I just want to put a little caveat, that's not all. I mentioned three to four million earlier because some of that is paid at the individual level. This is just the portion that's paid out of their withholding if their employer withholds it and remits it to us. So that left us, once we removed that, with $18.6 million. Um, from there, we removed using that same example, those 11 employers that we were able to speak with. And as you see, they make up approximately 50% of that $18 million. We were able to project the gain if residents were working from home and living in Reynoldsburg. We did that and we're showing you a 10% and a 20% of that, those tax dollars. That would actually be a gain to us. Um, because they would, if say if they work in Columbus, live here, they would be asking for the Columbus money back and paying Reynoldsburg. Um, however, that example I just gave you is one of the assumptions that we made. We don't believe um, that there will be very many, if any, indebted taxpayers request a refund if they live in a two and a half percent city, which is the same tax rate as ours. The same holds true as if it's a two percent city. So our projections are based off anything less than two percent. The reason why is it's not going to be advantageous for the taxpayer slash employee to ask for those monies back because they would be paying in most cases a preparer possibly 150 to $200 to prepare that return, and they're not going to net any mo anything monetarily themselves. It would just be a shift from one city to another. So we have removed that from the equation as far as a loss. We have not included it. Um, 
The loss from those top employers, the 79% of employees that work from home, um, they, 50% of them, we were able to determine reside in rental, in, I'm sorry, in a municipality with 2% um, or more. So that has also been taken into account. So for the refund portion, and you can see the other assumptions here, with the refund portion, we expect to lose 4.4, almost $4.5 million next year that has to be paid out in refunds for tax year 2021. The long-term work from home is the second piece of that slide that we talked about as far as the key influences. That piece, again, we want to focus on those top employers, 59, with 59, I'm sorry, 79% of their employees working from home. However, we made the assumption that they are going to come into the office one day a week, or 80% of their time would be spent at home, 20% here in the city of Reynoldsburg. Of those, we were able to determine from W-2 filings that 90% of those employees are non-residents. That in itself, we're expecting, if it's 10%, 20%, we're expecting, we didn't include the 10 or 20 here, we're expecting a $5.4 million loss. That, will, that is the piece that will start as early as January, and we will start to see that impact in our distributions from Rita beginning in February. Um, and we have confirmed with that, those, that group of employers that the payroll systems are changing as of January 1st. The second piece of this that I want to draw your attention to is the gain from residents. On the long term, it's a larger gain. And the reason it's a larger gain is because we're expecting that they will employers that are outside of Reynoldsburg, Columbus, Worthington, that they too, and I've, that's what I mentioned earlier, I've talked to other tax administrators around the state, some of our larger cities, and they are hearing from their top, top employers like we have that they're beginning to make those payroll system changes. So if they do like and kind, then we will start seeing monies come from other cities that would have typically been possibly to Columbus or Worthington. And so that's where you're seeing that we could potentially get a, a million to $2.1 million gain. Overall, the net loss um, is $5.2 million on that long term is what's projected. On page nine is the total of the two um, influences and the total loss is $9.7 million. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Joni. Um, I, I guess I do have one more slide in there. And I put this slide in there more for questions because as we were talking through this with some of our other administration here at the city, um, we received the question about, well, what about residents that live here that are working from home? I mentioned that we, we only get the three to four million dollars. I also mentioned that in our long-term projection, we hope to receive a gain from them. Um, but I also wanted to share with you um, this chart, which shows the returns are fi that filed by income range. And as you can see, um, the majority of our residents make less than um, 250000 Now, that could be a combined household. So we have the majority of them in the 10 plus and the 50 thousand plus columns um, and a few there in the hundred thousand but that's just to give you a, a little bit of an idea there so I'd like to turn it over to Joni so she can share with you what this impact how this will impact the general fund projections from here good evening um, thank you guys all for letting us speak um, I know this isn't an exciting topic but it's one that we need to hear early on in the process um, the last two slides, uh, um, I've just kind of given you a snapshot view of if um, Lori's projections 
um, come through the way that we think, what our estimated revenues will be along with the other revenue we get besides um, tax revenue. So um, the first column is if we just um, use the 19% reduction, which isn't taking into account any of the refunds. So um, our estimated revenues would be about 21 million 500. And then just based on the initial budget that we have, that's 25.5, it would be a reduction to our fund balance of like $4 million. I started our fund balance out of um, just about what it is right now in September. I anticipate the monies that we receive in October, November, and December will probably just be offset with expenses. There won't be any big increase. But if there is, that will just be a plus. Um, so that would make our fund balance go down to about $8.4 million. Um, if the um, reduction with the refunds, that would be more like 36%. Then our revenue would be around $18 million, and our reduction in the general fund would be $7.5 million. And um, then our fund balance would be about $4.8 million. Um, this kind of affects the general fund mostly because that's where the majority of our tax revenue goes. But it also affects our debt fund. Um, it also affects our CIP fund. Our debt fund, we have to make whole because we're obligated to pay our debt. So, um, you know, we might have to, how council does the percentages and how much our funds get allocated, they might have to change that allocation in the future if some of those funds um, become short. Um, CIP, um, you know, we've, we put a lot of money out this year in CIP. I don't know how fast that will um, build that balance back up if our revenues do decline as this um, all of Lori's work indicates. Um, I also included just a cop, um, just the last um, five years of the fund balance from 2016 before we had our, our tax increase up to 2020. Um, and you'll see that um, if the worst case scenario of the 36% reduction comes through, our fund balance is just a little bit above what it was when we, before we got the tax increase. Um, 2020, our fund balance went up a lot because we had that bump from the CARES Act where we were able to offset some, uh, like $2.4 million, we were able to offset some of our payroll costs. Um, so that was an unusually high bump, but I don't anticipate it being that much. So we, just, we give you all this information just because early on in the budget process, it'll help you make your decisions to make sure that you're making the best um, decisions for the future of Reynoldsburg, um, how you, you know, choose to use it. Um, you know, if you have any questions, give us a call. We'll be more than happy to answer them for you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have, I have a, I don't know if it's a question so much as a clarification. Um, I just want to do so. From the presentation, what I understood was there are several different possibilities. There are people that are currently coming into our city to work um, and their withholdings are for here in Reynoldsburg. Um, and the, say the company is not changing the way they're withholding. They could, but they're working from home in Worthington or wherever. Those people could apply for, I don't know what Worthington's tax <coughs> percentage is, but they could ask for that money back. Then uh, the second possibility is that the company that they're working for here in Reynoldsburg actually changes the way they withhold, in which case they're w they wouldn't have to apply for a refund. That money would just go to Worthington because that's where they live. And then those sa same two situations would happen for people that are doing the opposite. Uh, so companies in Worthington could start paying or withholding Reynoldsburg taxes if the person's working from home in Reynoldsburg. And, uh, and then people in Reynoldsburg could also apply for a refund if they work in Worthington or wherever. Okay. Like Correct. I said, I don't know that there's a yeah. question there. I just wanted to make sure mm -hmm. I understood all the... So there's two tax years because of the governor's orders. There's two tax years involved. The first is 2020. And that is on hold because of court cases. Um, but 2021, the legislators came out and they made it clear to the municipalities and to businesses that now that the work from home time frame has been extended past the governor's order, that employers may withhold that 
through the entire year, but at the end of the year, the employee can request that money be refunded. So essentially what's been happening is all of 21, our large employers, the group that we kind of focused on there that we were able to get data from, which was 11 of them, and they made up um, half of our withholding revenue. Um, they have been withholding that the entire year to Reynoldsburg. However, 79% of their employees have been in a work from home situation. Now again, there's still some unknown there, so we gave you a few assumptions, we built in a few assumptions there because um, it may not be 100% of them coming back and asking for a refund. And so I tried to take some of those out of there where we thought, well, there's not going to be a shift even if they ask. Um, and we did that, in all fairness, we did that both ways, that we wouldn't gain from those other cities either. Um, the second piece is the, the long-term piece. And with that, that same group of employers has told us we're going to start that withholding January 1. So all of what they've been withholding to Reynoldsburg in 21 will be no longer. Now, um, so since, since we are a 2.5% city, um, you said that the people that will, would possibly be applying for a refund um, would probably live in municipalities with 1.5% or 1.75% or, 1 or less. Was it an assumption as to how many people live in those lower tax municipalities, or is there some kind of real uh, number there? We know exactly how many people work, live, I should say, live in a, a place with uh, considerably lower taxes than Reynoldsburg. We know, we know um, and have reports, um, and all these projections were probably developed out of, I'm going to guess, about... 30 reports total, either from Rita or directly from our large employers. Um, we looked at W-2 statements from the, that group of large employers. Um, Rita was able to do a dump, what, they, what I call it, a W-2 dump um, from 2019. They showed me every single employee that worked at those employers, and from there I went through and um, sorted out any employee that had a 43068 zip code. So we know where those individuals are working, or we, they're in Reynoldsburg, but they're living, and we knew where, if they were here, and or how many of them were in a two or two and a half percent city. 50% um, of them, of that group, it was actually 52% uh, were in a city um, two or two plus five, 2.5 higher. Um, the other piece of it is yes, we know all of our residents, Rita captures that information. They capture the W-2s from them. And so there's a report that we use that shows us how many people in the total wage base that maybe were in townships. Um, the townships is what we're, we as tax administrators are saying is fair game. We pretty much know that's coming in because those particular individuals, they can claim for a refund and they don't have to pay anyone. Right. Um, so that money is going to be theirs to keep. And yes, we use those residents if they worked in a 0.75 city, 1.75, and we were able to, to build that into to this. Yeah. And the unfortunate thing is people living in Reynoldsburg, working elsewhere, probably aren't going to apply for refunds because we are at 2.5%. Uh, unless they're just really, really into giving the city some more money, which I would, I would endorse that. Um, right. And then we tried to, like I said, I've been talking to with other tax administrators. We tried to, from a cost standpoint, look and see, okay, realistically, who's going to file? And we used, a, I used a sixty thousand dollar figure in here that if they made less than sixty thousand dollars, they weren't going to file because it would cost them more to have their tax return prepared than they would get money back if they went, to like, say, a two percent city versus a two and a half that that half percent differential isn't enough to cover their tax preparation fee. All right, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? 
Yes. I, I have. President, President Council, sorry. No, you go ahead. So those um, ones that's going to get or receive a refund, it will be up to them to actually send that money to Reynoldsburg? It would be up to them to, to file a refund request form um, to ask for that money back. The money is already here. Their employer already remitted that money on their behalf. They withheld it from their paycheck, and they remitted it to us this past year in 21. Um, and it would be up to each individual employee then to send and claim for a refund. And that's the, the big unknown, so to say, because we really we don't have any way to say how many of those people will ask for a refund. Um, so that's where we started making some assumptions to take some of those out and kind of focus on a core group. Does that answer your question? Sorry. Yeah. It's a lot. <laughs> I mean, to, you know, we just receiving this and right. trying to understand it. Um, so I have to digest it, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and again, just trying to see if, because I don't think employees are going to know to ask for that refund. You know, um, I don't know if that is being communicated out um, to the employers, but, you know, I just have to look at this information. Thank you. And by all means, if any of you have any questions afterwards, um, please feel free to contact us. We're happy to. Um, answer any questions. If you want to come in and meet with us, we can go over some more of the information. Um, thank you for presenting this. Uh, it is a lot of information, especially when you're dealing with numbers. And it is going to take some time to digest to see how we just got it. But my question is, I was looking at page 11, where it talks about the 2022 general fund projections of 90% reduction or 36 reduction in income tax receipts. When will we get a good idea if it's going to be 19 or 36? According to the timeline, is it going to be more in February or is it going to be more in July or in between? Well, I think a lot of it, um, two things. We'll, we'll have a good sense in um, the end of the first quarter how many employers made that shift in January, because that's going to be a permanent change for us. Um, and that, on slide eight, that was 5.2 million, possibly. Um, doesn't mean they can't change after January 1. I've talked to a couple of cities, actually, today. Um, one of them has already seen two of their large employers make that change last month. Um, they think they're getting, you know, we think they're getting these payroll systems ready. Um, that's what we've been hearing. Um, one of theirs, uh, they saw a 40-some percent drop. Another large employer, they saw a 55% drop in what they would normally receive for last month. So um, we will know that. I, I say we will know that just because the large employers we talked to were looking, their target date was January 1. Um, and so that should be by the end of the first quarter. And that's why we hope to be able to continue to kind of keep the communications open with you and with the rest of our administration because it's a, it's a moving, it, it, it's full up, right? It's flying. We're not going to really know until next year how it's all going to shift out. So the refund piece of it, that's going to take a little longer because people typically don't receive their W-2s until the end of January. Then they start filing. There's 90 days to process those refunds. Um, I can tell you firsthand, Rita's getting inundated with paper, with electronic filings, um, but those refunds have to be out within 90 days. Um, we're going to be a one month behind that, so about 120. We should have a good idea um, by, I, I'm going to say anywhere from July, we'll start seeing all those impacts July, August, September time frame of next year. Good for us and all the other Ohio municipalities, that's a one-time one time, uh, impact. Um, unfortunately, we're going to get that impact 
and the permanent change in the same year. So we're getting hit twice, all of the Ohio municipalities that have an income tax. Okay. Um, oh, because I was going to say, I was wondering how, because we got this nice big piece of our budget that we got to go through. How is that going to impact the one that we're working on and obviously the one for next year when we get to it? Because it sounds like the impact is going to happen right around when we should start doing next year's budget as well. Well, I think for next year's budget, we'll probably be, unless something else happens, All right, years after next we year, will sorry. probably be in a much better um, position to be to know what that impact is because we will have a full year of collections under this new change under these employers changing to the work from home locations um, this year um, we don't know how many of them are making the change we also don't know um, with the refunds how many people are going to ask for those so that's where it's going to be a little bit of a kind of a give and take what we presented to you today to try to help you with what you're looking at as for this year's budget is we know for sure that top group of employers, we know for sure they're changing January 1. We also know for sure that 79% of their employees have had the potential to work from home all this year. And we have already received their withholdings. So if they do choose to ask for a refund, those refunds are due. Am I, Does that answer yeah. your question? And then, Joni, did you have anything to add as far as the, the budget? As far as the budget, I mean, as far as the budget, it's up to the mayor and council, you know, how you want it to impact the fund balance. Um, there's certain things that we have to pay, you know, Typically, 75, 78 percent of our budget is payroll. Um, it's not a lot you can do with that. Um, I don't, you know, you can look through the numbers and see the raises and things like that, but um, there's not really big raises going through. So there's not going to be a lot that you can do with that. Um, you know, when you when the mayor presents this budget, you can you know ask him questions about if there's any flexibility in that. Um, that wouldn't be something that I would be an answer. You know, that I would be able to answer. Um, that's more of a decision up to the mayor um, on how he would handle that. But um, in the past, generally, um, councils passed a budget that's balanced with the revenue. It might be a little bit harder to do this year because revenue is going to be a low number. So um, together, we just have to decide how much we want it to impact our fund balance um, and how much we can maybe push off until the second half or, you know, maybe make a mid-year additional appropriation if we see that things aren't as um, detrimental as they look <laughs> right now and, and, you know, add back some things that you might have to take out. But that's more of a discussion that you would have with the mayor <coughs> and council together as you guys go through the um, budget together. Because I'm trying to, and it's going to be hard, especially with the variant of court cases because the courts go at their own pace. Yeah. And Lori's been in contact with these top employers for the past couple months and, and trying to get this information. And, you know, these companies, um, they tell you what they want to know, what they want you to know when they want you to know it. Um, they're large companies, so they're not going to put any negative information out into the space um, that could ultimately impact their stock prices or their, their income and things like that. So she's been, you know, on them and working really hard. So I don't want you to feel like we just put this off to the last minute to tell you at the last minute we've we've been working really hard to try to get information um, you know we knew these court cases were coming um, they were able these companies were able to give us some more concrete data so that she could actually give you some numbers and put some percentages to it so um, you know we got it to you as early as we could so that it was as accurate as possible so um, you know Sorry, <laughs> that is not better news, but, you know, we wanted it to have available as you go through this budget process the next um, six weeks. Um, so, and if I could clarify just one item there about the court cases. So the court cases don't actually um, come into play with any of these numbers here. Um, these numbers are 21 
Uh, the court cases are for 2020 only. 2020. Okay, that was going to be my follow up. Okay, thank you. So for the 2021 taxes, the ones that have been withheld, so do you know if there's going to be any, um, I don't know, I want to call it education, but I don't know if that's the right term. Because, I mean, when I filled out my RITA for years, just when I get my W-2, where they took the taxes is where I worked. And I, that, that's just the way it is. But 21 is going to be a weird year because you might not have worked where, you're, where they took your taxes out. And you'd have to know to apply for, especially if, if you just wrote to your RITA like I do. Um, so is there going to be like a question on the RITA form or a, or, a, or a box that you have to read where it says you might be entitled to a refund if you work from home? But you know what I mean? Does that, does that make sense? Um, I don't believe so. Um, I know for uh, 2020, they did put something on the form to let people know that we would be holding those refunds um, until such time that the, the court cases were decided. Um, for 2021, I have not heard anything. Um, I know that there, the forms um, from working there for 18 years, I know the forms are typically uh, in almost a final state by the end of July, beginning of August. Um, I don't believe anything's going to go on the form. It's possible they may put something on the website. There's information out there already on the website um, about some of the legislation, House Bill 110, House Bill 197, Section 29 also impacted that. That's part of what the court case is about. I'm looking at Chris here because the attorneys just love that stuff, right? Um, <laughs> but um, we have talked, um, as I mentioned, I've been in regular contact with some of our neighboring communities here in central Ohio. Um, we also, because the legislators they want to make it easy on both the businesses as well as the municipalities. Um, but again, everybody is in this situation where we've never been here before, so how do we handle all of this? So um, we've talked about do we try to come up with, for those refunds, there's a certification process. Do we try to, as a whole, get together as administrators and come up with some things, maybe it's frequently asked questions, maybe it's a different type of certification form where we work with our large employers so that it doesn't become this daunting task and it's not this push and shove and back and forth between business and local government, so to say. Um, so that there will, be, there will be more to come on that. Um, I know in talking to at least a couple of our large employers um, in 2020, they did put out a memo, if you will, or some type of uh, statement to their employees as to how that was going to be handled. Uh, they are looking, they said, to do that for 2021, um, but yet they weren't yet ready to share that with us. So I will continue. Um, I know the mayor, too, has been in contact some, with some of our large employers. We've been trying to work as closely, and Mayor, uh, Auditor Sisek as well, as closely with them as we can. I was hoping to lean on ignorance just a little bit. But. No, I know, and I was hoping I could come in here and tell you we won't get any refund requests, but unfortunately, um, that's not the case. So. Thank you. Uh, Mayor. Uh, uh, President Salvati. Yeah, obviously, um, you know, having just gotten these numbers today myself, uh, it'll take some time to digest. So the budget that you saw is based on the previous assumptions. The, that being said, um, you know, I, I think the some legislators have used the phrase Pandora's box with this. Um, I think a few small legislators thought, hey, wouldn't it be great if, and then they went ahead and put it through without actually thinking through what the long-term ramifications are. So it's not just the city of Reynoldsburg. The city of Columbus could absolutely be devastated. Uh, with these changes, um, you know, cities of Dublin, Worthington, you know, all of the traditional norms of income and city budgets have all been based upon that if you have businesses in your community, you generate revenue off those businesses, that's what provides the services. This kind of flips the script considerably. Um, so I know we briefly talked about potential 
uh, programs where we would actually reach out to residents that live in Reynoldsburg uh, that uh, work somewhere outside of Reynoldsburg and you know basically persuade them that their tax dollars would be better used here. Uh, that being said, as we go through the budget, um, please feel free and contact us and let us know where you think that certain things could go. Um, as with all things, these are all assumptions, and while we know we, there are certain things we can count on that we do have to make uh, you know, about changes for, um, you know, there are other things that we still just don't know how, it, how things are going to react all the way through. Uh, but I'm happy to hear uh, all the feedback as we kind of go through, and uh, when changes need to be made, we'll do so. Um, I would like to think that while this is not the greatest news ever to be given at a council meeting, the reality is uh, the uncertainty of the pandemic, believe it or not, I think has prepared us very well for something like this, um, that we've been able to take what was an, in, in a sense another, another complete unknown of what happens when things are shut down and how that impacts a business uh, as far as what that can do. And we're very good at being uh, quick on our feet and uh, making those adjustments uh, you know, on a day-by-day, week-by-week basis to make sure that we protect the city's taxpayers' dollars and uh, still provide the services that they're expecting all the way around. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, I'm depressed, so let's have some public hearings. Um, <clears throat> uh, item eight is public hearings. There is public hearing on the following ordinances. Would the clerk please read the first ordinance? An ordinance creating the Summit Road Tax Increment Financing District, declaring improvements to the parcels within each incentive district to be a public purpose and exempt from real property taxation, requiring the owners of those parcels to make service payments in lieu of taxes, establishing a municipal public improvement tax increment equivalent fund for the deposit of those service payments, and specifying the public infrastructure improvements that benefit or serve parcels in the incentive district. Thank you. Uh, would anyone like to make a comment on this ordinance? All right. As I see no further comments, um, I'm going to close this public hearing for this ordinance. Would the clerk read the next ordinance? An ordinance authorizing local aggregation of retail electric loads in accordance with section 4928.20 of the Ohio Revised Code. All right, would anyone like to make a comment on this ordinance? All right, as there are no comments on this ordinance, um, I will close that public hearing for that ordinance. Move on to item nine on the agenda, which is motions. Um, first motion is a motion to approve a resolution to recognize the Hindu festival of Diwali. Council member Pacquerel will read this motion. Thank you, Council President Salvadi. And again, about before going to this one, we had a very good celebration last, it wasn't Sunday evening in front of City Hall. Thank you, Mayor, and all the council members who are present here. And we had an excellent celebration, uh, having many different people from various different communities coming together. It was nice. And uh, before I read out my resolution, I'd like to invite Neil Adhikari to come and say a few words. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pagrell, for inviting me to this meeting. Uh, Honorable Mayor, respected council members, and all the community members. My name is Neil Adhikari. I'm living in Reynoldsburg, Ohio, and I'm here to explain a little bit about the biggest festival that we had celebrated uh, a couple of days ago. But before that, I would like to congratulate all newly elected council members. We have full belief and confidence in you, and we know you will do amazing within your position. Back to what I was saying, Diwali. The Festival of Light consists of five days in which we celebrate different things. Day one starts with the celebration of birds, like crows. Crows are celebrated for delivering messages. Day two is the celebration of dogs. We honor them for being a man's best friend. The third day is the celebration of cows. They were celebrated uh, as being the incarnation of the goddess of wealth that we called Lakshmi. 
The fourth day is the celebration of auctions. And these are the tools of agricultural uh, things for the uh, village people. And the fifth and final is capped off by the celebration of brothers, by their sisters, and exchanging gifts and uh, blessings. Diwali also has historical importance, which dates back to hundreds and thousands of years, at which time God had reincarnated himself in the form of human on this earth that we believe. The myth goes on like this. The king of Ayodhya sent his son, Lord Rama, in exile for 14 years uh, due to his promise he had given his wife. Lord Rama was accompanied by his wife and his brother. One day, while both the men were busy, Lord Rama's wife Sita got kidnapped by demon Ravana. Diwali marks the victory of good over evil after Lord Rama defeats demon Ravana. As the trio returns to Ayodhya after 14 years of exile, they are welcomed and guided by the pathway of lights and oil lamps. It is very interesting how this might connect to our festivals and us personally. Back in Bhutan, we were also forced into exile, and after 20 or so years, we were welcomed to America, a new and brightened pathway with many opportunities waiting for us. Diwali, which for some also coincides with harvest and New Year celebrations, Diwali symbolizes the victory of light over darkness, good over evil, and knowledge over ignorance. The oil lamps and lights convey that it is time to destroy all our dark desires and negative thoughts and gives us more strength to carry on our positive vibes for the rest of the years. Also, I would like to thank the city of Ransburg for giving us the opportunity to celebrate Diwali in front of City Hall on November 5th, 2021. I would also like to give a special thanks to Councilman Mr. Packerel for his never tiring efforts for leading this event and making the necessary arrangement. We hope to continue celebrating such events in the near future in a grand manner. Last but not the least, with this, I would like to conclude my saying here. I would like to thank the City of Ransburg for giving me this space to speak forth about Diwali. Thank you for recognizing our festival and claiming October as Hindu Heritage Month. Thank you. Thank you all. all right, thank you, uh, Mr. Adhikari. So let me read the resolution here. Resolution recognizing the festival of Diwali. Whereas Hindu American Foundation and over 1, million, 1 billion Hindu around the world observe this festival of Diwali, the festival of light, which symbolizes the victory of dharma or good over evil. And whereas Diwali is one of the most celebrated festivals of great significance of Hindus, Sikhs, Jains, and Buddhists. And whereas recognizing the religious and historical significance of Diwali, the U.S. Congress has officially passed unanimous resolution in 2007 and has since been part of official White House celebration. And whereas Diwali renews our commitment to uphold values of truth, non-harming, charitable giving, community service, etc. And whereas Diwali is a time of worshiping light in the form of wisdom, knowledge, peace, compassion, and willing, well-being. And whereas Diwali is celebrated by many Hindus as, as a day of thanksgiving for homecoming of Lord Rama and the beginning of the new year of many Hindus. And whereas Sikh the, uh, six, Diwali is celebrated as a day that the sixth founding Sikh Guru or river teacher Guru Har Govind was released from the captivity of Mughal Emperor Jahangir and whereas the Jains Diwali marks the anniversary of attainment of Moksha or liberation by Mahavira, the last of the uh, Tirhakars, the great teachers of Jain Dharma at the end of the life of 527 BC, and whereas Buddhist, especially uh, the Newar Buddhist, Diwali is commemorated as Asoka Vijaya Dasami, the day of the great emperor Asoka, embraced Buddhism, embraced Buddhism as a faith, and whereas it is symbol, uh, there is a sizable population of Hindus mainly originating from Bhutan, Nepal, and India who have made Reynoldsburg their home. 
Now, therefore, be it resolved by the city of Reynoldsburg that the city of Reynoldsburg do hereby recognize the religious and historical significance of Diwali, the festival of light, and its message of victory of good over evil, which resonate with American spirit, and be it further resolved that city of Reynoldsburg, Ohio, in our deepest respect for all Hindu American heritage, proudly resolves to celebrate Diwali every year, passed this on 8th day of November 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Councilperson. Um, are there any questions or comments from the Council? I'll just give this one to I'm not signed, right? I'll bring it back to you afterwards. All right. So if there's no questions, uh, may I have a motion to approve this resolution? So moved. So moved by Councilperson Strickland. Uh, do I have a second? Second by Councilmember uh, Baker. Um, any other discussion? All right. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. The motion carries. All right. I'll move on. The next uh, item 10 is the reports. And the uh, first item on the reports is liquor permits. And there's Chief Baker. All right. Liquor permits, almost as exciting as income tax revenue. <laughs> try to help you out here. So first they won't one, cost us as much money. Yes. <laughs> the first one's a, a new liquor permit application for Ohio Springs Incorporated located at 8271 East Broad Street. This business will be operated as a sheet. Uh, the office holders for Ohio Springs are Thomas Luciano, Thomas Patton, and Gary Zimmerman. The liquor permit is for a C1, C2 class, which is for beer, wine, and mixed beverages and sealed containers sold for carryout only. This will be a new business, so there are no police-related uh, calls at this location. The Ohio Department of Liquor Control has advised us uh, that they know of nothing that would prevent the permit from being issued. I do not recommend we request a hearing for this permit application. Uh, two and three we can do together. Uh, this application was sent to us uh, to notify us of a change in the uh, LLC interests. Uh, MPC Investments, which held both of these liquor uh, permits at the two speedways in town, has changed to Speedway Holdings, but the managing uh, members are not changing. Uh, for those, I also do not recommend we request a hearing uh, for those permit applications. Thank you, Chief. Any questions? <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right, we're going to pause here so we can get a picture for the... Uh... Diwali. All right, the next item in reports is the Development, Parks, and Recreation Committee. Uh, I'll turn it over to Council Member Baker. Uh, thank you, President Savati. Uh, this is the Development, Park, and Recreation Committee uh, meeting for November 8th, 2021. Members in attendance are Members Cotner, mem uh, Council Member Lawson Rowe, Council Member Pacro, myself, and Acting President Savati. The first item on the agenda is an ordinance to amend the official zoning map of, for the city of Reynoldsburg for a property located at 
8555 East Main Street from Innovation, Innovation District to Community Commercial District. The first reading was October 11th, 2021. This ordinance has been brought back to committee to review the recommendations made by the Planning Commission uh, regarding the zoning. Um, Attorney Shook. Yes, thank you, Council Member Baker. Uh, this uh, application for rezoning had uh, two hearings in front of Planning Commission. At the second hearing, the applicant had amended their application to reflect that they were only requesting uh, rezoning for less than half of the parcel, uh, the portion of the parcel that uh, faces um, Main Street at the northern portion of the parcel for community commercial. Uh, after having made that change, Planning Commission went ahead and has moved to accept this proposal and make a recommendation to Council to approve uh, the rezoning with the following condition that a traffic impact study be conducted uh, depending on how the lot split is determined. Um, at this time, it is represented to council uh, to committee and requesting that this be sent to the full council for second read. Thank you. Is there any questions from the committee regarding this ordinance? Any from council? Okay. Um, seeing how there's no discussion, I'll make the motion that, oops, sorry. Yep, I will make the motion that um, we forward this ordinance on the council for a second reading. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilwoman Lawson Rowe. Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Ayes have it. This ordinance will be forwarded to council for its second reading. Council uh, Member Baker? I would like to announce that there will be a public hearing for this ordinance at the next council meeting, November 22nd. Okay. There will be a public forum at the next council meeting, November 22nd. Uh, state that for the record. Uh, the second ordinance, um, sorry, second item on the agenda is an ordinance making a transfer of funds in the Park and Recreation Department among various general funds, accounts, and declaring an emergency. Director Bauman. Thank you, Chairman Baker, members of the committee, members of council. Um, we are wanting to put in a sound system or loudspeaker system, paging system is what the company calls it, at both Huber Park and JFK Park. We do have the funds available within the budget. We are not asking for any additional appropriation. However, I was informed that it needed to come out of the 5,600 capital accounts versus my 5,300 services. So I am requesting the transfer of funds, and I am requesting uh, emergency language on this to be passed at the next meeting um, to in order to keep the pricing that we've been given and to ensure product delivery. Okay. Any uh, questions from the committee? Any from uh, council? Yes, I have a question. Yeah, council member. So, uh, thank you. I think this is most important item that we need. What kind of sound system are you going to put there? Um, it's going to be more of a paging system, so we could use a microphone or we can um, tie it to the, cell, to the telephone that's in the senior center. So we can pick up the phone and make paging announcements. Um, somebody can be in there and give the announcements, say, either for the tomato festival or during games. But there will also be a microphone that you can use outside. And these, uh, the horns, they're called horns, will be placed. One will be placed on the um, awning there at the senior center, and then there will be two placed on the light poles within the parking lot of Huber and one down by where the um, lightning detection system is at Huber Park. At JFK Park, it will be placed on top of the new restroom concession stand and one back at Diamonds 8, 9, and 10 so that it can be heard back there. So that's six? Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So now we have to work on getting some uh, older Reynoldsburg residents to just tell stories during the whole uh, Tomato Festival, like they do at the Circleville Pumpkin Show. Just Perfect. <laughs> you can be in charge of that committee. Really? Um, okay, any other questions from council? Okay, seeing none, uh, I move that we forward this ordinance on the council for its first reading. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Member Packerell. Any further discussion? Okay. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, ayes have it. This ordinance will be forwarded, forwarded to council for its first reading. The third item on the agenda is an ordinance making a transfer of funds in the Park and Recreation Department among various general funds, 
uh, accounts in the senior center and declare an emergency to Director Bowman. This one is very similar to the one we just discussed, except this one is going to be for um, uh, Horn's paging system to be placed within the senior center building. There are three rooms that do not have um, a a speaker in there so you can't hear the announcements that are made and these funds will come out of the senior center budget which is separate from the parks and recreation budget and we also have to purchase the wireless microphone um, for the senior center and some um, earpiece ones for hands-free microphones because the current ones that we have for some reason do not meet with the FCC guidelines so we're gonna go ahead and get the new microphones as well the package um, any comments from count or uh, the committee any from council? Okay. Seeing none, um, I'll make a motion that we forward this on to the council for its first reason. reading. Is there a second? Second. Second by council member Packerell. Any further discussion? Okay. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. Ayes have it. This ordinance will be forwarded to council for its first reading. The last. Item on the agenda for the committee is an ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter in a contract with OHM, OHM for architecture and engineering design and bidding services for improvements to Civic Park and appropriating funds there for Director Bauman. All right, thank you. Um, Aaron Dominey was here at the last council meeting and spoke about the phase one um, improvements that would be made for Civic Park. And this is just um, authoring, authorizing the mayor to go ahead and enter into contract with him and to appropriate the funds that are needed to uh, pay for the services of OHM. Okay. Any questions from the committee? Any from council? Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and make the motion that we forward this ordinance on the council for its first reading. Is there a second? Second. Second. Second by Councilwoman Lawson Rowe. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Ayes have it. And this ordinance will be forwarded to Council for its first reading. Thank you very much. Don't go anywhere. I have a side question. Yes, sir. About the skate park. Somebody had asked me a question, and I didn't want to give them the wrong information. And so <laughs> while you're at the hot mic, I want to know what's the status of it. I mean, Pretty soon winter will be here. So. Winter is almost here. It, um, it is going to be the death of me. Let's just put <sighs> it that way. So we started that project in March with the full intention to be finished by May. Um, once the skate surface and the plywood was taken off, we realized how deteriorated the interior structures were. So the staff has replaced every single piece of wood on those structures internally that you cannot see until you've taken off the plywood. So happy to say today, the last piece of plywood was put in. The steel has been delivered from Suburban Steel. So that hopes to go in. We're hoping to get that in by the end of the week, fingers crossed. Um, and then next week we have to take a little time off because there's a tree that needs to be decorated, um, which is for the lighting, which is a little more than just one tree. It's a lot of lighting that's gonna need to be done at the senior center. Um, we do have the skate surface that's going to go on. So we've promised the mayor that he'll have it by Christmas with a red bow on it. Um, but in all seriousness, it really has, you know, really taken a toll on us. We did not anticipate it taking this long. It was going to cost between three and four hundred thousand dollars to have an outside company do it. And we thought, why we can do it. Let's let's take care of that. Um, we have had some vandalize, vandalism mm -hmm. to what we have done. They've come in and tore apart what we've done, so now you have to redo that, so that puts you behind as well. Uh, we've had two staff members out on injury leave. We've had COVID cases, and then we've had our normal job that we've had to do. So we apologize that it's taken this long, but it will be done by the end of this year. And that's the better answer that I could have gave. So that's why I wanted to put you on the spot. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, back to you, um, Acting President Savani. Thank you. Uh, item C on the reports agenda is the Public Safety Law and Court Committee, and Councilmember Lawson Rowe will uh, take that. Thank you, Acting President Savani. This is the Public Safety Laws and Court Committee meeting for November 8, 2021. Members in attendance are Councilmember Cotner, myself, Councilmember Pecoraro and Acting President Salvati. Item one, an ordinance on appropriating funds from an account in the maintenance department and appropriating funds to an account in the police department. 
Chief Baker, you're already there. Thank you. Uh, I'll speak for Mr. Taggart here. Uh, what we are purchasing is a utility vehicle. Uh, as you know, we purchased a utility vehicle a couple years ago. Uh, we never imagined how we would use that vehicle as we're using it today because of the pandemic. Um, for those of you that's come to public uh, forums that we've had, we constantly hear uh, how the citizens like that. They like our officers in these utility vehicles because they're more approachable. They're able to get into the parks. They're able to get into apartment complexes. So we were looking to expand that program and add a vehicle. So we are adding a vehicle under our current budget. This is not an increase in any, any budget item. Uh, but with the last vehicle, we shared that with our maintenance uh, department, with Mr. Taggart and, and his crew. And uh, so when he found out we were purchasing this vehicle, uh, he saw some use into sharing that vehicle. And this is simply uh, him allocating some funds into our budget so we will share this resource together. So it won't be uh, just us using it. Uh, it will also be the maintenance department, and hopefully the vehicle uh, will be used to its maximum capacity by sharing that. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from the committee? Council? Okay, I'll go ahead and I move that we forward this ordinance to Council for first read. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Council Member Pacquarell. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. This ordinance will be forwarded to Council for first reading. Item two, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to purchase four hybrid police cruisers and related equipment for the Reynoldsburg Police Department. Chief Baker. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is something that typically will come to you after a budget is passed. Uh, in the past, uh, you you know how this process works with vehicles. And the latest, later we get in line, the longer it takes to get vehicles. And I'll give you an example of that. Uh, last year, we ordered our vehicles in the first half of the year. Just last week, we received them. There's been some issues with, with vehicles, if you've been watching TV, with uh, receiving vehicles. But we get in line, and we receive the vehicles as they become available. Uh, by bringing this forward now, it also provides the opportunity for uh, all public hearings to have on this um, item and not pass it by emergency. So that's why you're seeing this item now instead of after we pass the budget. Are there any questions or comments from the committee on this legislation? From council? I just have a question. Um, the hybrid cruisers, what's the, what's the thought on it? And do we expect some savings as we operate the vehicles what are you looking at yes thanks for asking that so i was hoping we would have some uh, of our own data this year and we had already have those cruisers that we ordered last year in service uh, unfortunately we just uh, received them last week we do have some data from westerville that shows a significant uh, miles per gallon increase in these hybrid vehicles um, so we don't have our own data yet but but we do uh, expect a significant savings uh, both in fuel costs and maintenance costs with these vehicles. We eventually want to switch our, our vehicles over to hybrid. That's going to be a process. We're not getting rid, rid of uh, good vehicles. We wait until they're at the end of their, their life, and then we'll cycle those vehicles out. Uh, but we do expect to uh, see significant fuel savings and maintenance costs with these vehicles. Uh, Westerville has seen those, those savings already. And so these will just go into the regular rotation for, you know, it's not – not going to be your your car that you get to take first priority on, just kind of rolling into the normal rotation? Yeah, these four else. will be allocated to patrol. Uh, we have several vehicles that are over 100,000 miles. We currently have one vehicle that's above 150,000 miles. Uh, about a month ago, the mechanics put a separate vehicle out of service because of maintenance costs. Uh, it was not worth fixing them. Uh, that vehicle was already supposed to be out of the rotation, but since it took so long to get our new vehicles, we had to h hang on to it. Uh, but these four will be allocated directly to patrol. And while you're talking, that threw a new question at me. Um, the different technology, different vehicle, how are our mechanics' comfort level on, on handling these products? 
Any, so I'm not sure. We, we, we always check with them. Uh, as soon as our vehicles came in, the, the three that we just received last week, they took one of those vehicles. I can tell you it was kind of weird for me. So I've never been in a pure hybrid vehicle. So uh, when I turned the key, nothing occurred. And I've never been in a vehicle like that. And until the, the dash said vehicle is, is started, <laughs> I had no idea it was started. Uh, and when we drove the vehicle, so I have a semi-hybrid vehicle, I think. I'm not a mechanic, but uh, there's only certain times at stop lights and stop signs that the, the engine will shut down. With these vehicles, anytime you're not on the gas, that engine shuts off. So you could be going 55 mile, 55 mile an hour down the road, take your foot off the gas, and that engine stops. So you're not burning fuel in these vehicles anymore. So I'm kind of excited to see what our savings will be. I think they'll be significant if you look at Westerville, uh, but, but we don't have our own data yet until we put those vehicles in the service. Cool. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? I move we forward this ordinance to council for first read. Is there a second? Second. Second by council member Pacquerel. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. On to item three. An ordinance to amend chapter 351 parking of the codified ordinance for the city of Reynoldsburg. Attorney Shipp, yes. will you speak to this? Yes, thank you, Councilmember Lawson Rowe. Uh, this is an ordinance to amend Chapter 30, 351, which is our parking ordinance. Um, there are three uh, changes that are proposed. The first is to give the uh, police greater flexibility to be able to remove vehicles that create uh, safety hazards um, that are illegally parked in the city, uh, including vehicles that are blocking fire exits and fire hydrants. Uh, in addition, we are seeking to amend uh, certain sections of the prohibited parking places section to include that uh, cars will be prohibited from parking within three feet of the edge of the apron of any private or public driveway. That's to give uh, residents a little bit more uh, safety uh, and flexibility in being able to get out of their driveway without it being potentially blocked by another vehicle. And in addition, we are making a minor change to uh, prohibit uh, parking within 20 feet of any intersection, not just the crosswalk of an intersection. And then finally, the third major change is to expand the streets in which there is no parking when there is more than two inches of snow on the ground. Uh, the list of streets was first uh, promulgated back in 1984, and so it hasn't been changed now in, all, in about uh, almost 40 years. So uh, there are a few streets that have been constructed in the city since that time, which are uh, major cut through streets, and those streets are Priestley Drive, Kingsley Drive, First Gate Drive and Rotaball Drive, Rotaball Road uh, from First Gate Drive out to Wagner Road. So those are streets that would be added to uh, the list of streets that you cannot park on when there are more than uh, two inches of snow on the ground. And that's to make it easier for our street sweepers and for travel down those streets. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from the committee on this legislation? Any from council? I move we forward this ordinance to council for first reading. Is there a second? Second. Second by council member Pacquerel. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. This Aye. ordinance will be forwarded to council for first reading. As there is no further business for the Public Safety Laws and Courts Committee, I return this meeting to you, Acting President Salvati. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to item D on the agenda, uh, Public Service and Transportation Committee, and Council Member Strickland will take this one. Thank you, President Salvati. This is the Public Service and Transportation Committee meeting for November the 8th, 2021. Members in attendance are Councilmember Cotner, Councilmember Pacquerel, Councilmember Lawson Rowe, 
myself and acting president of our team. Item number one, an ordinance to certify nuisance abatement costs associated with 54 Scenic Road in the city of Reynoldsburg and declaring an emergency. Uh, this is uh, this will oh. go to me. Thank you, Council Member Strickland. Uh, this is uh, an ordinance that had a, actually a second read back in June. Uh, the reason we held it was to make sure that we had service on the uh, property owner of uh, the bill for the nuisance abatement costs and service upon the lien holder. Uh, we have obtained that and this uh, property is currently in foreclosure and we want to make sure we get those abatement costs certified to the county uh, before it goes up for a share of sale. So that's the reason we are asking for an emergency passage this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Shug. Are there any questions or comments from the committee on this legislation? From council? I move before this ordinance to council for a first reading. Is there a second? Second. Second by council member Lawson Rowe. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. This ordinance will be forward to council for a first reading. Item number two. Madam um, Chair um, Strickland, I'm sorry. It'll be forwarded for emergency approval. For emergency approval. Thank, Thank you. you. Item number two. An ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into contract with South Southeastern Equipment Company to purchase a 2022 Val Valcal AJVR. 1015 hydro vac jet combination equipment wave competitive bidding and appropriating funds director dorman yes thank you councilman uh, strickland this is uh, an ordinance i don't know if uh, some of you are probably familiar this was brought before council a few years ago um, by the uh, water superintendent uh, we pulled it uh, as a result of covid uh, cuts and uh, this equipment, I don't know if anyone's familiar with it, so it's a vac haul, it's a, it's a jet vac. It's uh, used to dig uh, utility lines safely. It's basically a jet water, jet propelled, uh, propelled uh, equipment where it blasts the water into the hole and then there's a vacuum that's sucking the dirt up as it goes. Um, and our superintendent provided a pretty good uh, cut sheet on why he values this piece of equipment. In both cities I've been with, I've purchased one of these uh, large pieces of equipment. It's fairly common in the public work sector. Um, the nice thing about it is in the middle of the night when we get a call for a water main break, we can go out there with this piece of equipment. It only requires two individuals instead of three, and we do not have to call oops because it's safe when it's, it's just the water. It's as opposed to digging where you could actually pull something out of the ground. It's just the water. It's basically like a vacuum cleaner with water driving it. Um, so you never have danger of uh, damage any utilities. Um, it cuts the time, like I said, in half, basically for our call on call service, which saves us money in the end. There are times in the winter where we are so busy we have to call a contractor in to perform this work as well because we don't have this kind of truck right now. So when we have a few water breaks uh, going simultaneously, which does happen, uh, we will have one crew out there with a backhoe, and then we'll call another contractor in that has this type of equipment to help us out with another repair. Um, VAC haul um, is uh, sold by Southeastern Equipment. It is on the state term pricing, our state term pro pricing, which is why we're not going out to bid on this. So anytime somebody's on the state term pricing, it's already been vetted by the state to assure that we're getting the best price. But we did have three quotes. Uh, it's a fairly complicated piece of equipment. And if you looked at the attachments that were provided, I think it's a five or four page um, description of every little knob and tube that kind of goes on this piece of equipment. And this is coming out of three different enterprise funds because it will actually be shared by the street department, the sanitary department, and the water department. Thank you, Director Dorman. Are there any questions from the committee on this legislation? I've got a couple, please. Yes. Um, again, really expensive piece of equipment. So just is this a common item that other municipalities would have? It is, and both in both municipalities I worked for previously, we we did purchase one of these. Okay. Uh, and so it's not it's not like too. a luxury item. You think, oh, this would be really cool if we had. I mean, I know we have a lot of water breaks. We're trying to fix those, but I mean, this is something that, again, you would find it if you went to, you know, other municipalities similarly 
is shaped as us. It's not something you would always outsource then. Correct. And I think a, a lot of the reason municipalities went to it, obviously, is that because of the time it cuts off on a, on a service call. Sure. And also there's a lot of safety benefits to it. Okay. Um, uh, there's a lot less worker comp claims and people getting injured falling into a hole or into a ditch because you're literally just standing there with this and just basically sucking out all the dirt and then you just go dump it and you're done. So. And that leads to the next thing. You make it sound really simple, but yet just a moment ago you shared how complicated this device is, too. Is, that, is there going to be special training? Is this going to be, and as you said, three different departments using it? Is it going to be one key point person on that? Um, what's that going to look like, too? Correct. The manufacturer will come out and give training to the entire, all departments uh, to use it. Uh, complicated as in, for these guys, it's not very complicated. It's really okay. setting the pressure. Good it's um, the suction. It's it's pretty simple when it comes to. It's almost like a dental hygienist mm -hmm. kind of thinking, um, but pretty good at uh, once they get the hang of it. Pretty simple to use. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and we do, we do have a special building that was actually even built for this to house it um, a few years ago. So we will be storing it inside a a building that's built at the water plant right now. Thank you, Director Dorman. Are there any other questions from the committee? Any from council? I move before this ordinance to council for a first reading. Is there a second? Second. Second by council member Pacquiao. Any further discussion? I apologize. One more question. What's yes. the lifespan on one of these things? I'd have to look at the warranty. Um, I can get back with you at the next no meeting. Typically, I would say 20, 20 years, probably okay. at least. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. This ordinance will be forward to council for a first reading. Item number three, an ordinance to amend Chapter 953, Water Charges, Section 953.01A, Water Rate Schedule of the Code of Ordinance for the City of Reynoldsburg, Ohio, and Declaring an Emergency. Director Dorman. Yes, so it's that time of year uh, we talk about water and sewer rates. Uh, I know we received the email earlier from a resident in the city as well uh, discussing this. We've mentioned this to council that, you know, we knew these rates were coming. Uh, Columbus, I wouldn't say drags their feet. They kind of go through the same process as we do trying to figure out, okay, what do we need to do this year? Um, what does it look like budgetary? And then trying to figure out how they're going to fund that. Um, once again, Columbus does provides 90% of the water and sewer services within the Franklin County area. Um, we are a master meter community, um, just like Gahanna, Obetz, and um, Bexley. So once again, whenever anything enters the city, although we're getting it from Columbus, we're responsible for it. Um, so back to the piece of equipment we're asking to purchase. Uh, when we get a water break, we're going out immediately and fixing that break. Um, we're restoring service to the residents because when they lose water, we're, we're back out there and probably within three to four hours, they're back up and have water again. Whereas in the city of Columbus, they will typically just let it run and they may not get out there for days or even weeks, depending on the weather. Um, those people will see a loss in pressure, which for a business and a resident, it's not the greatest thing to have. Um, the sewer is the same way. So all the sewer, when it comes in the city, we're responsible for it. It goes down to Columbus and gets treated, and that's what we're basically paying them for. On the water, we're paying for it when it comes in. On the sewer, we're paying them for when it goes out to treat it. Um, as we somewhat discussed last year, we were kind of alluded to by Columbus that these rates are going to start increasing, uh, I wouldn't say exponentially, but I think last year it was a little less. It was like a 2% rate. Um, this year they went up you know, to the 3 and 4% rate. Um, we've been told it could go up to 7 and 8 percent. Unfortunately, we really can't control that. Um, we did call some other communities today and, and kind of the other master meter communities and got their uh, opinion on where they're moving forward. Uh, the only community that hasn't really decided, I think, was Gahanna so far. Um, Obetz and Bexley are both just passing through only the Columbus rate. Um, obviously, they have a little less infrastructure than we do. Um, we always add a tiny percent on top of that because we have certain orders through the EPA that we are mandated to follow, and that involves cameraing our lines every year, replacing old infrastructure. Um, that is what that money is used for. So when we add that 1%, that's just going to the enterprise fund. And once again, we don't move that money around. We can't move it to salaries. We can't move it to the parks department. Um, that is strictly has to stay in the water department fund. So we've done a lot of stuff this year. We entered into a new trash contract. It added a tiny increase to the residents. We just recently passed the stormwater increase too, which once again was a Columbus increase. 
Um, in total, if we look at the water and sewer and the stormwater increase, it's a 97 cent increase. Um, that is with the Columbus rates. And when you add the city's rate on top of that, for an average family that uses 20,000 gallons a quarter, um, they are currently paying uh, $379.80. Um, when we would do our increase, that would go up to 400. Uh, let's see here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Wait a minute. Let me check it again. I'm sorry. Trash and sewer. I'm sorry. So when you add trash, because that's the other thing we bill for trash as well, they're paying $455.19 a quarter. Um, with the increase, it would go to $477.26, which would be a $22.07 increase a quarter, which is about $7 a month. So I know the percentages seem high, um, but when you look at it on a monthly basis, it's kind of what you pay for Netflix, kind of what you pay for your streaming, one device. It's about a $7 increase a month, and that's for everything. That's for your trash. That's for your water, sewer, and storm water. Thank you, Director Dorman. Um, I do have a question here for you. Um, we did receive the communication from a resident regarding is there any incentives regarding for the senior citizens or low income um, yes. residents that live here. Can you speak a little bit about that? I can. So we have kind of been working on this. Actually, even last year, we started discussing this option. Um, with COVID, though, because we weren't charging late fees, we weren't doing turnoffs, we just we went through the motions, but we didn't implement anything. Next council meeting, we will be introducing an ordinance that will offer a 10% discount for senior citizens up to 10,000 gallons. The reason we do the 10,000 gallon limit is because that would be the typical consumption for a senior citizens, a couple living by themselves um, for a quarterly bill. Um, so obviously if you have a multi-generational family in a home, they can still apply for the discount if they have an elderly person in the home. However, it only applies to the first 10,000 gallons. Have we worked out those details yet regarding the application process or who needs to be contacted? Or is that, you know, the residents have to contact us? Yeah, so it's, it would run similar to our trash. We all currently offer a trash discount as 10% as well. We're going to just essentially use our same list because it's actually done in the water department and just translate it to the water bill. Thank now, those you. who are not registered, this is a good thing because some people probably aren't aware of this. Hopefully that will get out. We'll put some information on our website, um, publicize that a little bit. They can still come in and register and apply for that rate. Do you know of any other city that also give um, discount for low-income families? Not that I'm aware of, no. I mean, we do, and I, you know, we talked about this last time when we were discussing COVID. We will always work with people. You know, if someone's having a rough month or a rough year or just a time, um, we will always set up payment plans. We will, you know, work with people. I can't tell you how many times I walk in there and, you know, someone's asking me and the mayor and I will talk about it. Okay, let's, let's come up with a reasonable plan, um, you know, and then, and honestly, most people are good about that. I, I'll be honest, typically on a monthly basis, the people that we're turning off or we're sending notices on are the re it's reoccurring. Um, you know, the, that's why we can typically tell if someone, we can look at their history. If someone hasn't called us in three years, you know, we can, we can work with them. And we do have, I think, a one year, once a, once a year forgiveness or every two years where we allow people, you know, the late penalties and other things, we'll waive them for them too. So we're always sensitive to people in their, their situations. Thank you, Director Dorman. Are there any questions from the committee? Yes, I have a question. So, two questions. So I think one you already answered is the increases per, per quarter or per month, $7 uh, uh, increase. I'm uh, sorry, 10,000. You're giving discount for 10,000 gallon of water is per quarter, right? I'm sorry, what was that one more time? Uh, the planning for giving the discount for senior citizen for 10,000 gallon, that is per quarter, not per month. Per quarter, correct. Well, no, correct. Up to so they could use twenty thousand gallons, but we'll give them the ten percent up to the ten thousand gallons because ten thousand gallons is a a very normal consumption if there was two senior citizens living by themselves in a home for three months. So my next question: uh, We have been anticipating this increase for a long time, and now we bring this up right now, and in, and it has an emergency in it. The, the emergency is st still three reads. Um, the only thing we can't comply with is a 30-day because we have to have this effective the first of the year. And unfortunately, we just found out what Columbus decided their final rates would be. 
So we're not the only ones in this position. I don't even think Gehanna's actually been Gehanna hasn't yet. even put any legislation forth, so they'll probably actually be forced to go to a two-read emergency based on our conversations from today. But, but understand, we're very sensitive to that, too, and we, we wish. I mean, they, they'll tell you this is what they're thinking, but they won't finalize it till the next meeting, and that's what we just found out. So. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the committee? From council? I know we talked about going from paying every, was it three months, to try to create something that's more every month so people will know what they're using, what um, they can budget for per month. Because sometimes when you get this bill three months later, some people don't remember, and so they're scrambling call on the city about trying to get on some payment plan because they can't afford it. Yeah. And I do want to say this uh, to back your claim up about working with people because I remember the one lady uh, resident that you helped, that she came to me looking for help and the city took care of her. So once again, I thank you for that. But where are we at with with that, I, this is just a question I was asked. I don't know if there's yeah. any follow up or yeah, whatever. no. So you know, as we as we work into the budget next year too, that's one thing we're doing is uh, we're consolidating software. And you know, Joni and I have uh, the auditing department, myself, the water department have been working very closely on um, some solutions to that. Uh, one thing we've uh, we're going to move forward with is you know we, the the billing option, which is this is kind of cross. The building department as well. This affects the building department, the water department, kind of all the departments. But with this, we will get a new module which will allow the residents to actually look at their own consumption. So they can go to the website, bring up their account, and they can say, wow, I used you know, this much. But the nice thing about that, too, is it allows us to set up some standardized reports that we can run on a daily basis or however need be. And basically, we can say, tell us where it looks like someone has an abnormal consumption. Once we see that, it'll basically print that out. We can notify those residents saying, hey, we just ran the report. It looks like you guys might have a leak in the house, and we're noticing your consumption is really high. We'd like to send someone out you know, from the water department to maybe help you or just talk to you about it. So that's part of uh, moving forward next year is we'll have that ability, as well as the remote meters too. So um, this has been a long time coming with the water department, um, kind of catching up. But we have several meters, thousands of meters in the city that have the ability to remotely call in, but right now we're using a company to drive around. Um, we'll be turning those on probably in the next month, um, which will help too. So people can really see their consumption every 24 hours. They can get on there and look and see how much, and that's how we know. And we'll see all of a sudden that graph just shoot up in the <clears> air. <throat> and once again, we'll work with people like we had a gentleman who just came back from snowboarding, and he had a toilet running the whole time. And mm -hmm. he was not asking for a discount or anything, but we worked with him. We took the sewer rates off. We, we, we found a nice balance for him. He still paid a fairly large bill. Um, but that was something, if we would have known that, we could have seen that. Now, he was far away, but he probably could have had a family or a relative go in the house and at least turn the water off. So. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I move we forward this ordinance to council for a first reading. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Member Lawson Rowe. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. This ordinance will be forwarded to council for a first reading. Item number four, an ordinance to amend chapter 945 sewer charges, section 945.92C, rate schedule of the Code of Ordinance for the City of Reynoldsburg, Ohio, and declaring an emergency, Director Dorman. So, once again, kind of explain this, just the same as the water, the, the rates that were Included in there were total rates of water, sewer, and trash increases on an average resident home. Any other questions from the committee? From council? I move we for I move you, you <laughs> I move we for this ordinance to council for a first reading. Is there a second? Second. Second. Second by council member Pacquerel. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. This ordinance will be forwarded to council for a first reading. Item number five, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into an intergovernmental working agreement with Franklin Soil and Water Conserv Conservative District to support the Big Walnut Watershed Coordinator Program administered by Franklin 
Soil and Water Conservative District in coordination with and support from MORPSI and the State Watershed Program with ODNR and Ohio EPA. Director Dorman. Yes, this is an annual contract that we do enter in with, uh, uh, they call it a working agreement actually, not a contract, with Franklin Soil and Water Conservation District. Uh, they work with most of the counties, or most of the cities within the county, um, as well as the unincorporated areas in Turo and whatnot. Um, they provide us with uh, assistance regarding stormwater. Uh, stormwater pollution is probably the biggest thing they help out with. On occasion, they'll help us out with some sedimentation erosion control inspections. And every year, they do an annual rain barrel and rain garden workshop, which hopefully maybe some of you have attended or been part of. Um, that program is you know, a great program every year. People attend that. When they leave, they get a free rain barrel they can hook up at their house and use to conserve water or plants at a local nursery they can get free uh, to install a rain garden. Uh, they also are in the school districts. They work with the schools in the Envir Envirothon and in the environmental science departments, helping them with some uh, educational components as well. So, Thank you, Director Dorman. Are there any questions from the committee, from council? I move before this ordinance to council for a first reading. Is there a second? Second, second by council member Pacquerel. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. This ordinance will be forwarded to council for a first reading. Item number six, an ordinance to repeal chapter 1305, section 1305.01, 1305.02, 1305.03 and replace with section 1305.01 and renumber section 1305 1305.04 1305.05 1305.06 1305.07 1305.08 1305.09 1305.10 1305.11 and 13512. Of the codified ordinance for the city of Reynoldsburg, Director Dorman. Yes. That was a lot so of dots. Easy, easy, <laughs> easy introduction there. So I have to say that Drew Longenberger, who's been interning with the city for quite some time now, um, kind of turned this little project over to him. Um, this has been something, once again, it's I'm all about kind of cross communication with departments, getting everyone involved. I think even you know, Chris was involved in this, uh, the building department. Um, uh, Molly helped out quite a bit with Drew as well in getting this ordinance uh, uh, written and uh, hopefully passed, or at least I should say introduced tonight. Um, every city looks at their fee schedule. They should look at their fee schedule, you know, periodically every two years, every couple years. We haven't looked at our fee schedule since 2017. Um, some of our fees were a little low. Some of our fees were a little high, especially as we were getting development now in the city. It's important to look at our fees. Um, obviously, we're not in the business to make money, but we should at least be making sure we're staying whole and covering our costs in the building department and other areas on inspections. I'm going to be actually coming to council next meeting to increase some funding for our plumbing because development is so good, um, our money in the plumbing area has pretty much been exhausted. Um, we are turning over thirteen to $15,000 a month in plumbing inspections. And just today, our new CBO started for the city, which is the first time we've had a CBO in the city for many, many years. Um, so our goal with this was to take all the various sections of code that the city has where it references one fee and another fee and put them in one concise document. So when someone walks in the door, we can hand them the document and it lists all the fees from your zoning and your plan reviews to your building and your inspections. Um, we called multiple communities. I had Drew. We, Drew and I worked together on this. We've worked on this together probably for the past five months at least, maybe longer. We called Gahanna, Canal Winchester, Pickerington, Whitehall, Westville, Obetz, Pataskal, and New Albany. And we bas basically took all of their existing fee schedules, cross-referenced, put them in a database, and did some comparables. Anytime we found a number that varied more than $10, we took a look at that and we adjusted it accordingly. Um, not that we want to be the most expensive, but we also don't want to be the cheapest. So we're pretty much now in line with all these other communities that are surrounding us in the fee schedules. Thank you, Director Dorman. Are there any questions from the committee? From council? Yes. Councilman Baker. Jeez. 
I just want to give Drew credit. I mean, I know yeah. uh, Director Dorman gave him some credit, but from council, I want to give you credit, young sir, because I'm, this looked like it was a long, tedious process, and the information you provided was well-deserved. So just want to say thank you. Any other comments from the committee or council? I move we forward this ordinance to council for a first reading. Is there a second? Second. Second by council member Lawson Rowe. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. This ordinance will be forwarded to council for a first reading. As there is no further business for the Public Service and Transportation Committee, I return the meeting back to you, Acting President Sabati. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Next item on the uh, report's agenda is the Finance and Administration Committee, um, which is more of me. Um, so this is the Finance and Administration Committee meeting for November 8th, 2021. Members in attendance are Council Member Baker, Council Member Strickland, and myself. Um, first item on the agenda is an ordinance to authorize the mayor to enter into a development agreement with the Center Ice Foundation of Central Ohio for the purpose of future sale and redevelopment of real estate and declaring an emergency. Mayor Begany or Sir, City Attorney Shook. Uh, thank you, Chair Salvati. Uh, obviously, this is in regards to the piece of property the city had purchased um, what seems like just days ago, but was actually a few weeks ago, uh, for the uh, potential for a development of the Center Ice Foundation, uh, which would include all the materials that were brought out before the two sheets of ice, the field house, and things of that nature. Uh, the development piece is set to go into effect, uh, so that way they can continue doing their due diligence and working with their sponsors to go ahead and get this project off the ground. Uh, I'll leave it to City Attorney Shook to talk about some of the eventualities in case things do work out the way that they are supposed to. And then, uh, unfortunately, we will make sure that there are considerations for if things do not work out the way that they are supposed to, what happens in that case. Uh, thank you, Mayor Begney uh, and Council Members. Uh, this is a development agreement uh, negotiated between uh, the Mayor's Office and the Center Ice Foundation of uh, Central Ohio. As you will see in this development agreement, it's structured very similarly uh, to what we saw with the Trivium Development Agreement for the Happy Dragon site. Uh, there are some significant differences, however. Um, one of the most significant differences here is that because uh, this is a project that uh, the city has actively recruited uh, from this nonprofit foundation for the purpose of being able to provide uh, an ICE facility and a multi-use facility to the city, uh, this is a piece of land that the city would be willing to donate uh, to the Center ICE Foundation for the purpose of uh, having this development take place. Uh, that will not take place, though, unless the uh, Center Ice Foundation can raise the funds that they need to build what they hope to build. Um, we are going to uh, incorporate, you know, whatever site plan that they are be able to provide into a purchase and sale agreement uh, to ensure that that is the project that is actually built on this property, uh, with, of course, a reversion to the city if that is not what is built. In addition, the charitable portion of the development uh, will also come back to the city and will be leased to the Center Ice Foundation on a ground lease for $1 a year, similar to what we currently do with the YMCA. Uh, this is an 18-month option uh, development agreement, so the Center Ice Foundation has uh, that time period by which to go ahead and engage in their fundraising efforts and their site development efforts and present a project to the city uh, within that time frame that is acceptable to the city, at which time, if that takes place, we can negotiate uh, a purchase and sale agreement. Um, those are the highlights of the development agreement at this time, but I am here to answer any questions that council may have. All right, are there any questions or comments from the committee on this legislation? Go ahead, Council Member Strickland. Attorney um, Shook, so I just want to make sure I understand. So the foundation will have 18 months to actually raise any funds for this particular property? What was, what was the 18 months for? Maybe? The 18 months is the time period by which they have to uh, present uh, a, a project site development plan to the city 
um, that is satisfactory to the goals of what this development agreement is attempting to obtain, um, specifically uh, the, the ICE facility and, of course, the multi-use facility. Any other questions from the uh, rest of council? Because I have a question. Yeah. So, Attorney Sook, um, oh, sorry. you mentioned that we're doing similar to YMCA. So, YMCA, I think we spend almost, I mean, several million dollars. So, are we giving money from taxpayers' money to this one as well? No, we are not. Um, this would be an entirely privately funded. Uh, construction effort. The public contribution is the land. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. I move we forward this ordinance to council <clears throat> for a first reading. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Strickland by a second. Um, uh, any further discussion? All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. That motion carries. That ordinance will be forwarded to council for its first reading. Uh, second item on the agenda is an ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into a letter of intent with Daimler Group Incorporated for a future sale and commercial development of land owned by the city. Mayor Begany. Uh, this is the other piece of the larger puzzle for that land. Uh, Stamler Group uh, is wanting to go into an agreement with us uh, for this piece of land for, um, I believe, $190,000 an acre for a total of $950,000. As Council will recall, we purchased this property for $1.15 million, so we make uh, a majority of our funding back with this particular uh, agreement. We are already working diligently with this group uh, to hammer out a more uh, firm purchase agreement, but this is to uh, basically a letter of intent saying that this is the process and what will ultimately be there uh, for a medical facility that will be in the range of 50 to 60,000 square feet, approximately two to three stories uh, as of right now. Uh, the same provisions uh, from the other contract that City Attorney Shook put in as far as you know the expiration timelines for when they submit a plan and things like that are also very similar. And their employees won't get to work from home, right? Um, I thank you for saying that. Um, no, I think we could put that in. An, I think that we may have to put an agreement in there somewhere. No, they, doctors have to work here. <clears throat> All right. Uh, do you have anything to add, Attorney Shook? You no, I would, I would just note that uh, the major difference between this letter of intent and the development agreement is that the letter of intent is not a contract. Um, you know, this is a statement of intent on the part of the uh, developer. Uh, we actually anticipate that this project is going to move so much faster than the Central Ice Foundation project that we'll be presenting a purchase and sale agreement uh, before we ever get to a development agreement. All right. Are there any questions or comments uh, from the committee? All right. From uh, the rest of council? I'll just say one thing. I'd just like to thank the mayor and city attorney for their due diligence on this project, I think it's a, it's going to be great once we get the shovels in the ground, and I look forward to it. But just want to give public kudos to the city mayor and the city attorney. All right. With that, I will move we forward this ordinance to council for its first reading. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Council Member Strickland. Um, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. This ordinance be forwarded to council for its first reading. Third item on the agenda, an ordinance to authorize the mayor to enter into a contract with governmentjobs.com for NeoGov software appropriate, appropriate funds and declaring an emergency. Director Bowler. Good evening. Uh, the NeoGov software is a applicant tracking software. It is also a software to help onboard employees. <coughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, it has some really great features that we're going to uh, think we will find uh, beneficial. Uh, we will be able to pull out uh, identifiers for uh, potential employees, such as um, names and uh, 
addresses and in some cases universities where people can sometimes have their biases on just looking at certain names uh, or some of that information. So we will pull that out before we give it to the hiring supervisors. So when they're determining who they're going to interview, they are looking strictly at uh, qualifications, experience, and education. Uh, we will also uh, have the interview set up online so that they, again, have to, they're not meeting a face at first. They're seeing qualifications. Um, the onboarding part of it is just having all the forms online, which will be much easier when we're hiring people instead of me sending a stack of papers and killing a bunch of trees every time we have a new employee on board. Uh, by doing a three-year agreement, um, we will... Um, the first year will be $9,992 or $22. Uh, and this would um, include the um, training and the setup of the software. Uh, this is a three-year deal in order to do that. The total for the three years would be $32,954. Um, but if we uh, just do a single year, it would cost us $17,161. So there is a savings by doing a three-year agreement. Thank you. Um, any questions or comments from the okay. committee for yeah. Director Bowen? Uh, I, I did want to just add oh. something. Uh, we had uh, quite a few conversations with the City of Columbus with the Human Resources and their diversity uh, staff, and they use the same software, and they felt uh, mm -hmm. they are the ones that gave us the guidance on um, this is a, a very good tool in uh, trying to get a more diverse workforce. All right. Fantastic. Question. Yes, I do have a question. Do you know if our school um, human resources use something similar that we could possibly use? Or is this just something now? The reason why I'm asking mm -hmm. is, are we doing a lot of hiring, right? What, is this going to be really beneficial to the city? Uh, well, the schools, uh, the school does have some sort of tracking software not similar to this. Uh, NeoGov is used throughout uh, many, many municipalities, uses this. I can tell you for the civil service positions uh, with the Reynoldsburg City Schools, they are hired through our same civil service commission. Uh, so there is the potential that we could post. It's mainly clerks um, in the schools. Um, since I don't hire them, let me think for a minute. School cooks, hmm. school bus drivers, uh, the the non professional uh, non teaching staff. So that would be utilized in that tracking by uh, civil service. So this would be used by civil service and um, my department, <laughs> me. <laughs> At this point, uh, it would be used with us jointly. Okay. Thank you. Right. Any questions from the rest of council? All right, I move we forward this ordinance to council for a first reading. <clears throat> Do I have a second? Second. Second from council member Baker. Um, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that motion carries and the ordinance will be forwarded to the council for its first reading. Fourth item on the agenda is an ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into a contract with the uh, for the city of Reynoldsburg's health insurance coverage with Medical Mutual for, of Ohio for the period of January 1st, 2022 through December 31st, 2023 and declaring an emergency. Um, Director Buller. Yes, so this is one little bit of good news for you this evening. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, we uh, have been able to get a uh, two-year deal for our uh, renewal for our Medical Mutual, and this is the health care insurance for uh, city employees. Um, we will have a 4% increase uh, for that coverage for 2022 with no increase at all for 2023. So it will help with us projecting. Uh, that is very, very good rates when you, whenever you're looking at insurance numbers. Uh, employees, of course, share 12% uh, of that cost. Okay. Um, any questions or comments <clears throat> for the director from the committee? 
Okay, for the rest of the council. All right. In that case, I move we forward this ordinance to council for its first reading. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Second from council member Baker. Um, any further discussion? All right, seeing none, um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Um, <clears throat> on to item five, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into an agreement with the Kirsch Group Technologies LLC for information technology services for the period of January 1st, 2022 through December 31st, 2022, waive competitive bidding and declaring an emergency. Dr. Bola. Yes, so director Bowler, sorry. <laughs> so you can be Dr. Bowler for the what, yeah, I'll go with that. <laughs> um, Kirch Cruz Technology is the company that supplies the IT services for the city. Uh, we have been uh, in agreement with them. I believe this is the fifth year now. This is the exact same contract that we had with them for 2021. So again, a little bit of good news, no rate increase. Okay. All right. Any questions or comments from the committee for the director? All right, from council? All right, well, I'll move the forward this ordinance to council for its first reading. Do I have a second? Second. Second from council member Strickland. Um, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. This ordinance be forwarded to the council for its first reading. Moving on to item six, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to execute a renewal contract with Mutual of Omaha for employee life, accidental death, and dismemberment, sh uh, short-term disability, and long-term disability insurance for the period of January 1st, 2022 through December 31st, 2022, and declaring an emergency. Director Bull. <laughs> yes. Uh, so this is the, again, life um, AD&D short and long-term disability insurance coverage for uh, city employees, no rate increase, uh, same coverage that we have for 2021. All right. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move we forward this ordinance to council for its first read. Do I have a second? Second. Second from council member Baker. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Right, I'm gonna take a drink before I read this next one. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> I don't know if I said ordinance way forward to the council for its first reading. Um, item seven, an ordinance to amend the chapter uh, 160 personal procedure manual section 160.02 um, authorized positions, personnel, classification, and pay grade administration, parks and recreation department, uh, part F police department, and G to service department, building division, section 160.03B, supervisory, pay range, C, senior police management, D, seasonal employee, uh, part one, parks and recreation, part two, service department, part three, street department, uh, section E, occasional labor and independent contract section, 160.04, Part four, tomato festival event staffing compensation section, 160.05 overtime eligibility, section 160.07 longevity, and section 160.12 city clothing provided, uh, senior police management uh, for the city of Reynoldsburg, Ohio, and declaring an emergency. Whew. Director Bowler. Yes. So every year about this time, we bring new changes that, uh, to chapter 160. Uh, this is uh, potential uh, additions of staff, changing of pay ranges, and uh, other things that we'd like to get cleaned up in this ordinance. Um, it is every, uh, everything is just spelled out within your packet, but I did want to just touch on a few of the changes that you'd see there. <laughs> Um, one of the additions we have is the addition of the diversity, equity, inclusion, compliance manager. 
Uh, we are working with the school to, uh, district at this point to potentially partner with on that, that particular position. So we will have more information as we move forward in that process. Um, we're asking that the senior center assistant, uh, it is a part-time position. Uh, we would like to change that over to one full-time position instead of two part-times. We'd like to change the title of the data entry operators uh, to uh, deputy clerks, which is more in line of what they actually do, um, as, as opposed to that. Uh, Parks and Recreation is requesting a, um, an additional uh, parks ground maintenance, and this is due to the agreement that we have with the City of Columbus and taking on that Bryce, is it Bryce Park? Thank you, uh, Bryce Park. Uh, they would just need more staff to uh, maintain that and also changing that pay grade from a four to a five. Uh, we also um, are hoping to uh, possibly enter into agreement um, with another go government agency, but we are asking to add park rangers. If we can enter into that agreement with uh, uh, Metro Parks, we would uh, potentially have them uh, hire the, those staff but for right now, we're just asking them to be added in 160. <coughs> Excuse me, there's more. <laughs> um, we are asking to add a public safety social worker supervisor. This is probably going to be... Towards the end of 2022. Yes. <laughs> um, and then we would change the classification of the social worker that we currently have and uh, switch that up to a supervisor and then a employee range. Um, we just hired a new CBO uh, in that search. Uh, we discovered that we have that pay grade set way low uh, to get the candidates that we need to recruit. So we are asking to change that pay grade from a 19 to a 21. Uh, this is based upon information in the Morpsey study. Uh, and I think you all received a really big, thick packet of the Morpsey study uh, recently. Um, we are also asking for the pay range changes for uh, supervisors, directors to be adjusted. Again, the Morpsey study is showing that, um, that we are fairly low in that category as well. Um, we are changing, uh, asking for the title of the seasonal recreation employees uh, to be changed from seasonal recreation employees to recreation leaders. Um, and this is kind of in line of what other municipalities would call that staff. Um, and then the rate increases that you're going to see under seasonal employees, occasional employees along that line. Um, people can get uh, positions now at local fast foods or stores and uh, we had some hard times uh, recruiting for seasonal work this past summer and um, increasing the salary has surely put us in a better spot um, as everyone is hiring we were too and was we were struggling um, for the tomato festival uh, compensation staffing um, we are um, we have language in there that if an employee, a regular employee, uh, because I think anyone that was there seen, uh, took a lot of bodies to get uh, the event um, off the ground, but we're asking for um, any employee that works four hours either on Thursday or Friday and a four hour shift on Saturday, uh, they would get their compensation, but they would also get one personal day that we would allow them a very short window to December 15th to uh, be able to use that personal day to just entice more uh, of our staff to work those event, that particular event. Um, almost done. <laughs> longevity. Uh, we're asking for uh, longevity. Right now our current language says at the conclusion of the sixth year, which is technically the seventh year, um, most municipalities um, begin longevity at five years, just simply uh, beginning longevity for our staff at, at, on the anniversary of their fifth uh, year here. And then uh, clothing for police staff, um, dry cleaning allowable for our um, court liaisons, a practice that we've always had in place, but there was a discussion recently um, 
that it was not in writing anywhere, so we're adding it to writing. And then um, <coughs> right now we list out a bunch of equipment for uh, police officers in uniforms in Chapter 160. Um, just like to change that language to refer to um, refer to the contract, the reunion contracts, rather than constantly trying to update a document. And that is it, and I would be happy to answer any questions. If I could just jump in on a couple of quick points, just for clarification. Um, the park rangers for the parks department would actually also serve as potential animal control officers, which I know is something that uh, has been asked before in case the city decides to move in a different direction. Um, as well as some of the additions for the uh, person working for Bryce Park. This would just authorize the city to have those positions. It does not necessarily mean that we would be hiring them at any point in time. It just means that it, when the time came that we would be prepared to do so. So obviously in light of some of the conversations from earlier about budgeting, I just didn't want you to sit there and freaking out about what we were talking about doing in the process of this. But these are things that in the past council has asked and to maintain kind of the quality, especially for the Bryce Park area as well. Uh, but they're subject to whatever the situations and circumstances we find ourselves in at those times that we find ourselves in. So, uh, tiny little point, but I noticed the park ranger mm -hmm. line didn't have a pay level. Is that on purpose? Yeah. It, it, it looked on purpose. <laughs> it kind of is on purpose and we're in flux with what we're doing with it. Uh, we have identified it as a, probably a pay grade 12 right now. Um, since uh, I have never been part of hiring a park ranger, and I believe Director Bauman has not either, uh, we're having to do a lot of research on that. And some of them can be OPATA certified, which means they have arrest powers and carry a weapon. Some of them do not have that. We have to really define out what we want them to be doing and uh, making sure that but by your final read, you would see that pay grade. TBD. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um. <clears throat> All right, any questions or comments for Director Bowler from the committee? Councilmember uh, Strickland? Yeah, I do have a question here. Um, <clears throat> so I remember last year we talked about doing some pay increases, those mm -hmm. steps. How is that going to apply, or is it going to apply, I guess, now to these new pay range, uh, ranges that we now having or are discussing tonight? So the difference is the um, hourly employees or the non-supervisory staff are in the steps. Anyone that is a supervisor does not have steps um, that they get a raise on. We pretty much work on merit. Um, so an evaluation determines what, what your earnings are or your potential, but we do have to remain competitive. And if you uh, have an opportunity to go through the MORPSI study and kind of see where we fall with um, many of those uh, those levels of positions, I think you'll see that we've made a little bit of strides, but we're still uh, further behind in what we uh, need to go so, so we can continue to attract good talent. The phrase RTI is something that is used here in City Hall and at the Street Department, Parks Department. RTI uh, stands for Reynoldsburg Training Institute. And what, for whatever reason, the reputation of the city has been that you start here in Reynoldsburg uh, and you earn your experience and then you go to another city that will pay you more later on. And while in one respect, you, you know, you get a short term benefit of having a lower starting wage, what you end up losing is the institutional knowledge of those individuals that are there, especially now this case, supervisory positions, they could go to other places, but if they do so, then we're not only losing out on, you know, the wages in that pact, you're looking at the experience, the training and the ability to get caught up into speed, which actually hurts longer. Um, you know, it's one of the commonalities of background from human resources that uh, Director Bowler and I have in common is the impact of turnover is significantly more so than the actual initial investment. And then the rest of it is all honesty. Um, our staff is amazing at every level and they should be compensated as best as possible for those things because of what they do. Uh, obviously, we know that if we had the opportunity, we could pay them a number of things higher than what they are. However, uh, what we want to do is we want to make sure that they are remaining competitive with local communities around us. So if they want to leave, they can see our pay rate, but then they can see the way that we are dedicated to our employees and realize that really this is the best place for them and they can't go anywhere. And this is across the board, right? So we're looking at every department, right, and starting 
to really make sure we are faring out against other municipalities. Is that correct? Okay. Yes, we're, and we're constantly looking at the, the Morpsey study. Uh, every time there is an opening, we look at that job description, we go in and compare um, to see what it is. I'm in a, a uh, human resources network, so I'm constantly sending in, uh, in, uh, inquiries out. Uh, can I see your job description? Can I see your uh, um, hiring pay, you know, your hiring pay, uh, what your benefits look like? Um, and um, as you see, uh, there is many, many people hiring right now, and um, there seems to be a big change in what people are looking for. So I, <clears throat> I assume this one and the next one are emergencies, just three read emergencies, so they're in place for next year? Is correct. That, yeah. uh -huh. Correct. Okay. All right, any questions from the rest of the council? All right. Um, in that case, um, I move forward this ordinance to council for its first read. Do I have a second? Second. Second from council member Strickland. Uh, any further discussion? All right. Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Motion carries. This ordinance be forwarded to council for its first reading. Uh, item eight is an ordinance to amend the personal procedure manual regarding employee conduct hours of work, overtime, call-in pay, and vacation leave, and declaring an emergency. And one more time, Dr. Bowler. Yes. Um, so the PPM changes this year is we're just adding a statement. Uh, it is in your packet as well. Um, just uh, on employee conduct where we're just telling uh, state making a statement that the uh, city has a fair and, and uh, inclusive respectful workplace um, I can read the whole thing to you but it is in your packet um, the call-in pay is changing uh, the call-in pay from um, and that's just when um, one of our street or water department folks are called in that they would receive a minimum now of three hours pay as opposed to two hours pay. Um, that seems to be what uh, other municipalities is, uh, has in place. Um, the overtime pay is relative to the um, exempt status of the uh, social worker and the soon to be uh, social worker supervisor. So uh, once the supervisor is in place, uh, that would be the exempt position, and then the so social worker themselves would be um, an hourly employee. So uh, there's some sunset language in that on that line there that just says once that position is filled, um, then the other would revert back to an hourly employee. And lastly, the vacation leave. We have about 11 employees uh, here that are permanent uh, part-time employees, so they work year-round for us, um, working 20 hours or 30 or 32 hours um, a week uh, here. Uh, a lot of them have quite a bit of longevity with the city of Reynoldsburg. And um, for their vacation accruals, um, they get either 1.54 hours of vacation a pay period or 2.31 hours of vacation it stays there forever at that same rate. They never have the ability to uh, accrue any more time. Uh, so we just wanted to give them the same ability that our 40-hour uh, employees do, that they would, uh, based upon their years of service, they could uh, begin earning a, a higher earnings of vacation. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> are there any questions or comments for the director? I do have a question. Yep. Sure. Is this in line with other municipalities that's doing this? Um, the other municipalities, a lot of them uh, do not have uh, as many part-time positions as we do. Uh, we have uh, quite a few employees that work 30 hours a week. Uh, we have found that that to be beneficial if you don't really need a 40-hour um, you need service, but a 40, uh, 30 hour will suffice. We provide, you know, that allows us to pro provide them benefits. Uh, so we are a little unique in how many of those individuals we actually have on a permanent basis. Okay. 
Okay, any other comments from council? All right, I move we forward this ordinance to council for its first read. Do I have a second? Second. Second by council member Baker. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, motion carries, and that ordinance will be forwarded to council for its first read. Um, thank you. <clears throat> item nine, thank you, Director Moore. Um, item nine is an ordinance authorizing the city auditor to fund the health savings accounts for 2022 and declaring an emergency. Chair Silvati, members of council, good evening. This is an annual ordinance to fund the health care savings accounts for our employees. And I ask for it to go to the full three readings and pass in as emergency so it's in force for the first of the year. I would want it on there in the first of the year. So, um, All right, any questions or comments for the auditor on this uh, item? No? How about from council? All right, I move we forward this ordinance to council for its first reading. Do I have a second? Second. Second from council member uh, Strickland. Sorry. Uh, any further discussion? No. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? All right, motion carries, and that ordinance will be forwarded to council for its first reading. Item 10 is an ordinance to transfer funds among various general fund accounts for the year end cleanup and declaring an emergency. Year end cleanup. Chairman Silvati, this is, an, is another <laughs> annual piece of legislation that comes from our office. It'll change probably during the three reads that we read it, but this is what we need for the, uh, to close out our books for the end of the year. Sounds pretty straightforward. Any questions for the auditor on this one? All right. From, uh, from the full council? No. All right. I move we forward this ordinance to council uh, for its first reading. Do I have a second? Second. Second by council member uh, Baker. Um, any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries this ordinance before the council for its first reading. <clears throat> Item 11, an ordinance to make appropriations for expenses and other expenditures of the city of Reynoldsburg, state of Ohio, during the fiscal year ending December 31st, 2022. Mayor Begany. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the moment you've all been waiting for, uh, we are talking about this year's budget. Um, so what we're going to do is just a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, each director will come up and speak uh, to some highlights of their individual things, things that were uh, that are different or might look different from last year's budget to this year's budget. Um, and uh, there's a couple of other items to keep in mind. Obviously, materials cost has gone up considerably, so those things are being taken into consideration as well. Uh, due to the fact that we don't currently have a director of development, I will go ahead and start with that one. Uh, the director of development, the department, is going to be pretty much similar to what had been uh, done the last few years uh, and has come in under budget uh, in the previous years. The only things that would be added to this would be uh, additional funding for two studies. These would be conceptual corridor studies, one specifically for the Old Town and Old Town neighborhood area. Uh, this would be an opportunity for... Um, something that you would basically almost an overlay to the zoning code that would make it very specific about what could and could not be built in those areas to meet the aesthetic and qu uh, materials quality needs that would go a little bit further than what our typical zoning code would be. Uh, in that way that if a developer were to come in and say they wanted to open up a business or build a home or something like that in uh, one of those areas, Old Town or Old Town neighborhood, they would basically be handed a booklet of what they could and could not do right from the beginning. And anything outside of that uh, would not be allowed to be done. And obviously, council would have you know their time for input on that one. The additional corridor study would also include everything from what we're currently nicknaming um, the, you know, the medical mile, which basically would begin at uh, Main Street and Wagner Road and heading out east to wherever as east as east goes. 
Uh, right now, currently, I would expect to go to the Eastwood facility, which is the uh, new development that will be opening up across from the Department of Agriculture. Uh, same mentality that you would have an idea of what would go into that area. Uh, however, this would be a little bit different because it's not as dense in, uh, as some of the other areas in like the Bryce Road corridor, which has a specific set or something along those lines. This would be very specific to uh, the topography of Wagner Road, or I'm sorry, from Wagner Road all the way out to, uh, again, probably Summit would be the, the location. So this would include items like uh, you know, standardized uh, bike paths and sidewalks. This would be quality of materials. This would be what to do with power lines and all of those other things. So again, when developers are looking in that area, they again would know specifically what they are looking to do. Um, I have briefly spoken to the uh, to hopefully who will be our new uh, development director, and so they are going to go ahead and study that one. Too, but uh, we don't feel there'll be any other changes to this particular position uh, from from other than what you see outside of any you know uh, last minute adjustments from that particular area. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions specific to that particular thing as best as I can. Otherwise, I can move on to the next to my next set. And again, well, obviously, this is being the first read. You'll have plenty of time to digest it and then uh, come back with questions the next time around. Um, the biggest change that you'll see in the mayor's office is actually kind of a continuing uh, combination of the mayor's office and the community events coordinator that, will, that serves under uh, the mayor's office. As we all know, Jennifer Clemens works with the city-based uh, community events. And so one of the things that you'll see is moving the parks and recreation, uh, the overtime that was normally dedicated to that particular unit for events like the Tomato Festival, the 4th of July, things like that, uh, would then be moved over specifically to uh, the community events uh, reporting to my office. Uh, we have also allocated additional funding for additional events that have come on the request of council. In this case, it would be uh, specifically Juneteenth. Uh, it would be the Pride celebration and then uh, potentially some things to do with Diwali, depending on uh, the scope of those types of things. Uh, the only other addition to this would be uh, something similar to what you will see um, in the, probably within the next two years. We're probably not sure about this. This year, we obviously allocated funding for our brand new website. Um, thankfully, that work will begin in earnest, I believe, in about three days from now or two days from now on the 10th. Uh, and then next year, uh, if you've looked online, you will see a community guide that is actually available on a web version. Uh, we hope to have a published version of that to be going out to the community members sometime after the first of the year. And there's a potential idea of a community survey that would go out. Uh, a number of communities do these um, every couple of years. It's more or less a check on how do you think we're doing, how, what can we do, areas of focus, things of that nature. Uh, but those would be the ones specific in the area for the mayor's office slash community events. Uh, with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Director Dorman from Service, if he's still awake. Okay, as the mayor said, and actually... As we went through earlier tonight, we talked about some of the, the items. Uh, the largest item that's actually on my budget, and I probably have probably the, I, I do have the most amount of uh, subcategories, I guess, of the budget, uh, maybe other than PD, but uh, the hydro excavator was, it's actually in our budget for next year. We, as we discussed last year, there were some issues with bringing ordinances in after the budget had been passed, and with COVID, there were so many delays, it just caused things to be months, if not even a year behind. So we're introducing that tonight in conjunction with the budget. Um, obviously, if we pass the budget come January 1st, we'll then execute uh, the purchase order to purchase that. So um, I'll just quickly go through some of mine for the instance on the building, or I should say on the mechanics side. Um, as we talked about, as we increase the fleet, uh, there is some need for uh, additional funds in the repair and maintenance supplies and the operating supplies. Um, as the fleet gets a little bit older and we add to that, like I said, that's just basic normal costs as well as COVID costs. COVID costs have affected everything um, from pipe underground to just basic car parts. Uh, so we've just added a small amount. Once again, these are not huge uh, inflationary costs. Um, that's my mechanic category. Uh, as far as the service department, uh, we have some increases there. Uh, some of the main ones were for our street lighting. Um, it's based on uh, utility bills that we're paying, anticipated cost with the new developments from Spring Hill Farms, um, Rose Hill. Uh, once again, we're anticipating about a $25,000 increase in general utility bills for street lighting throughout the year. Now, to offset that, we are also looking to spend some additional money this year in retrofitting 
most of our street lights along Main Street and potentially Bryce to LED fixtures. Um, currently, we're running some old um, incandescent metal halide lights. Um, that'll actually improve the look and the feel, the temperature of the lights. It'll be nicer to cleaner, crisper light. Um, but we're also looking to do that as we go and do projects, for instance, the Main Street Phase 1 and 2. Those will all be LEDs as well. Um, so we're looking at doing that conversion. Um, Fourth of July fireworks. Uh, there's a small increase there because we've talked about coordinating some music with the Pyrotechnico and doing some music as well with those. Um, let's see here. That's pretty much all is in service. And like I said, if you have any other questions, you know, feel free to ask me as we go along. The building department, as we mentioned, we now have, when I first started working here, we had essentially one code enforcement officer. We have three now. Um, we'll be looking at maybe hiring an additional fourth. That would bring us to full staff, um, as well as our CBO that just started today. Um, all of our code, uh, code enforcement officers are certified. That's the first time we've ever had a certified code enforcement officer in the city. Um, two of them are currently the new one will be. He has to be certified. Um, Within the next month or so, I'd have to look and see exactly. But with that, becoming, you know, bringing that a professional accreditation on staff also requires they continue to get CEUs and stay current with their accreditation. So there's some small increases there in the department um, just to cover that. Um, there is one other um, item in the service department, too, or I'm sorry, in the building department, is the purchase of an uh, electric vehicle. Uh, our code enforcement officers are driving around pretty much all day to have a electric vehicle makes absolute sense for them um, we can recharge it either at the y or at the station up the street but we've also talked with the chief as we redo the uh, police parking lot um, having one or two ev chargers put back there as that technology improves and you know services start to use that more often you know whether the pd gets a, a full ev vehicle even just a small you know cadet or a bike um, they can use that so um, that that vehicle is on there, and we have some fairly old vehicles that code enforcement has been using for, for many, many years. Um, that would be the building department. I'll move on to uh, six, uh, street fund. Uh, we talked about the conversion of the LED lights. Um, there's also a line item in there for repainting all the light poles along Main Street. As you noticed, maybe some of the burgundy has not held up so well, probably not the best color to paint um, those kind of fixtures. So we are using, there's a company pretty much that does this called Martin. We've gotten a quote from them. We will go out and ask for additional bids, but just to develop the budget this year, um, we've added money in there to repaint all of the light poles along Main Street to a black, which will match what we're doing along the store, phase one and phase two areas as well. Um, and they also have asked for one new roadside mower. They do do some basic mowing of the cemetery um, that we've talked about that we're also looking to redo over on Wagner. And they also do some roadside mowing in some of the areas um, uh, in front of our properties and others throughout the city. Um, water fund, uh, once again, water and sewer, the only real increases there are a result of the hydro excavator. And once again, that's coming from three different enterprise funds. Um, so that would be the water and sewer. There's no other major impacts there. Um, there are some adjustments, once again, based on just gas and oil costs that are going up, as we've seen. We're all paying a little over $3 a gallon now. Um, once again, a nice benefit if we do build the service garage, we'll have our own fueling station, and we'll be able to buy gas at a considerably cheaper rate than what we're paying currently at Speedway. So um, solid waste, that would be the only other account we'd probably uh, want to talk about. And once again, that was just based on our contract. Director Dorman, um, so I know you said we're going to repair some of the light poles on Main Street. Is there any discussion regarding um, any repairs within our residential areas? Yes. So as we do our street programs, we are looking at, so I, I have a holistic approach when we do a street. So when we do a street, we're going in there, we're looking at, now we're looking at the sidewalks. So anytime we're doing, so instance, Priestley this year, we look at all the sidewalks along Priestley. We look at all the signs and we look at all the street lights. So when we're in there, like I said, we're only inconveniencing the residents once. Um, now, if there is a street light that's in really bad condition, people can let us know about it. We can go take a look at it. We get calls pretty frequently that where streets are out, street lights are out. Um, just recently, I had my code enforcement, one of my code enforcement officers, come in early. I asked him, authorized him to come in early 
to do a light check of all the parking lot lights that were along Main Street. And we actually found over 300 parking lot lights that weren't working along the commercial district along Main Street, which makes a huge difference. You know, when those lights are on, it's a little more vibrant. It feels safer. It makes it look like these businesses are operating, you know. So, you know, we're working with some of those property owners to get those turned on. I know the old Kmart site is actually even putting up some solar lights just so as the library moves, there's some light for that parking lot. Finally, that light, that parking lot has been dark for many, many years. Um, Chief can probably attest the more lights we have, it's, it's a good thing in some areas, especially for the kids walking to that library now across the parking lot. Um, but as you said that, yeah, we do look at those lights and, we, you know, if they're in really bad shape, rusted or, you know, leaning, um, you know, paint is one thing, you know, a lot of our poles and the residential, it depends on where they are, they are painted, some of them are faded, once again, it's just, I don't know what happened, I don't know if it was just a bad paint job or a bad quality product, it, typically when we order them now, they already come powder coated, we don't, you really shouldn't have to ever paint them again, um, the salt will have its, you know, issues, but typically they should hold up a lot better than what I've seen here, so. Okay, yeah, I know there's one uh, light pole on Matterhorn, I believe. Okay. That's been there forever, and it's, <laughs> I think it's black and the rest of them gray or vice versa. Oh, okay. Um, so I had a lot of complaints about that, so I don't yeah, know send if me there's that something too. we can do. And sometimes I think, you know, it depends, like, once again, COVID, when we order our signal poles for the Main Street project, they are an 18-week lead time, if not longer. So in that case, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe it got hit in the middle of the night and they didn't have the exact same style, so they just put something up temporarily and maybe they didn't get back to... I'm going to chalk it up to that and maybe they didn't get to put the right one up, so... Well, hopefully we can see about putting the right one up, so... Yeah, let me know about that one. We'll okay, I will. Thank you. I wrote it down. We're good. Okay, good. I know the mirror was on it. Any other questions for service? I'll go ahead and ask for one. Actually, uh, two things. One, side, sidewalk cleaning. When you walk down Main Street, there's gravel and mm -hmm. just crap on the sidewalk, especially after uh, the, after the snow melt. Yep. When we're yep. out of winter and spring. Um, have you looked at upgrading a, a, a not a fee schedule, but a schedule to make sure the sidewalks are are clean? And two, the I don't know what the heck they call it. I call them bells. Those the things on the sidewalks that look like bells. Oh yeah, the bells. And they look like crap. Yeah. I mean, they've you, been, yeah, they're, they're once again it was a neat kind of idea and concept. It didn't work in reality. They get damaged. Cuz I'm I'm just saying you talking about painting the um the light poles. Yeah. Can we get something done about them just because when yeah. you're driving up and down Main Street it looks like junk. And no, I agree. I agree. We're, we're going to uh, one more, yeah, yeah. and about the benches that are on Main Street. You know, they could use some tender love and care, too. Well, so with the site furnishings, I should say, when I say site furnishings, I, I mean the bells, I mean the street lights, I mean the benches. Um, we already pulled all the benches in the old historic area, Phase 1. Those are all getting replaced with, you know, powder-coated black, you know, cast iron, real nice benches. Um, Director Bauman and I can talk about, you know, I think there's, there's definitely some conversations that need to be had. You can buy a small, uh, like a Cushman cart that has a broom on it. It's almost like a street sweeper that you can run down a sidewalk to kind of clean it up. Um, fairly cheap expense, you know, for kind of what you get out of it. You can use it after the parades and, and other areas around the city along the trails. That's something we can look into. Um, we've talked about more maintenance on the trails, you know, throughout the city too. You know, one thing next year that we're going to be doing as part of our street project is uh, sealing or paving. Uh, the trail that runs all along Bryce and then all the way down Livingston to the Metro Park. It hasn't been touched probably since it's been built, and it's way past due. Um, so just kind of that upkeep, you know, it's all about the upkeep that we're unfortunately 20 years behind on, but some of that stuff we can still save if we jump on it. Um, the other stuff, you know, we're trying to figure out ways. But, no, we're, we're going to be looking at those walls along Main Street next year too. Um, as you know, a lot of them are just falling down, so we're trying to figure out ways of saving some of those that we can and the ones that we can't. What can we reuse? Can we just reuse the footer and the foundation and put up a nice decorative fence? Um, you know, the, the landscaping is very intense for the Parks and Rec Department. We've talked about restoring some of those areas to just a nice turf, which would look better you know, most of the year. So just things we're talking about, and we'll be bringing that back to you once we get some ideas more on paper. Because so. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that because I have brought that up. Yeah, a while ago, and so about me, I'm, 
I only like to talk about it for a little bit, but I like to get some action going on it. And the second one is also a maintenance schedule about the the brick pavers that are on the sidewalk. Mm-hmm. You know, you got grass and stuff that are going through them, and I'm sure they haven't been touched since they got laid down. Yeah. And, you know, Main Street is a main drag at Reynoldsburg. You know, we want people here, but we don't want our street to look like crap. No. Yeah, you're right. No, we so in, in Bexley, we would spend every other year, we'd almost have to almost not pull up, but every crosswalk that went across Main Street in Bexley, we'd pull some of the bricks up, redo the base, reset the bricks. You didn't have to do the whole thing, but every year you had to re-sand the joints and do a little bit. We've not done that here. You're right. Some of those areas are pretty bad. Some of them can still be saved. We've talked about looking at a block-by-block basis. Uh, one, the mayor's uh, corridor concept he was talking about, those will help too. You know, having this vision when Alliance goes in and when we hopefully can redo that intersection at Bryce and Main with Alliance and correct the curve that's there that uh, everyone drives off and ends up in the parking lot at the old Walgreens, fixing all that stuff. We've talked about making those major intersections more of a gateway and doing smaller walls and some fencing in between those blocks. You know, it's very intensive, you know, for not only cost but just staff um, for the materials and staff. So you're right. Sometimes simpler looks a lot better and cleaner. You know, you get too fussy, and it kind of is what it is there right now. It looked great the first year it was in. I guarantee it looked great probably the first couple years it was in. The problem is now it's it's just went without anything. So. All right, good thank points. You. Good points. I have a question. Run. Sure. No, no more questions. <laughs> President no, Silvati, uh, may I have a, I have a question? A cool. I thought so. Okay. Piggybacking on Council Member Baker. The brick wall that's on Main Street that's close by Wendy's, mm-hmm. is that city owned? It is. It, it is. And so that's another eyesore that I've noticed for several months um, yes. when I walk up and down Main Street. Is that something that will be addressed at some point? It is. It is. And that's, you know, yes, it will be addressed. It's, we're trying to figure out if we're going to rebuild. That wall is basically buffer zone is screening for the houses that were behind there's also a fence behind that wall i think a privacy fence that was put up but yes those walls have basically collapsed we had emh and t do a brief report on the walls and kind of their synopsis was that and i've had two masons come out and look at them and they can't most of them can't be repaired um, they just weren't unfortunately designed great to, to, to put it lightly uh, there's really no drainage in the walls, and the water just basically hits the top, the cap, what we call it, of the wall, and drips down. That's gotten in the mortar. It's froze. It's broken the mortar apart. There's nothing. That wall collapsed. It literally just fell down. Um, luckily, no one was by it when it happened, but we've talked about trying to figure out. It's such a big wall. We're trying to figure out what the the best thing to do with it is. Um, it may just have to come down. We've done that. At the Walgreens one, it was hit four times in one year um, by drivers. Uh, and it, the last cost to repair it was, I think, $18,000 for just the one little section. So knowing that if we did that and it would just get hit a couple months later, we left it, knowing we're also looking to realign that intersection. So it's not that we forget these things. It's just we're trying to make sure that whatever we put back doesn't go through the same. Uh, Thank you. I just want to make sure that it's on yeah, the no, list. It is. I and- it, yeah. It's more of an eyesore when you walk by rather than driving yeah. by. And it's like the brick is crumbling on the yeah, sidewalk. I see it. I see it no matter if I drive or walk, unfortunately. But yeah. 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 Uh, thank you, Director yeah. Dorman, for everything that you and your team is doing. I, I know that we're still trying to catch up, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, like you said before, we 20, 30 years behind trying to catch up on some things. Um, so I do appreciate everything that you and your team are doing you. um, to get us up to code. So thank, thank you. Yeah, we'll, we'll get there. I think, you know, we've seen a lot of positive uh, comments from residents. The rental registration has been a really nice program. I've, I've been amazed. We have one code enforcement officer that probably spends his entire day uh, with people that have, are calling because they're, they're worried about their living conditions. And we're going out there and we're getting things fixed. It's been really nice to see that appreciation you know, and, and handling some of those things. So. Thank you. Appreciate it. Next contestant is Human Resources. The 
the good news is, is I don't have a pretty large budget. So uh, the, um, the uh, 2022 goals is just to bring more training uh, in for staff. Uh, I think my miscellaneous contracts probably went up by $2,000. Uh, we do have a local uh, individual, Diane McDowell, that does provide some training for us. Uh, she does a really good job on our diversity, equity, and inclusion training and harassment training. Uh, she's going to be doing some other training for us uh, in the com coming year. Um, we um, had drug free a drug-free workplace training, which offers some discounts for our workers' comp. Um, we had online ethics training for staff. Uh, we do want to get that in-house as soon as we can, um, have someone come in and do that. It's free, <laughs> so, uh, but it is uh, a little bit more entertaining to have someone speaking to you as opposed to doing the online stuff. I think we've all had plenty of those uh, going on there. We're also going to do a um, have all the supervisors and uh, staff uh, to start coming up with good training procedures for their employees um, so that uh, everyone gets consistent training. Uh, so that's kind of my goal for uh, 2022. Uh, the big ask that I have this year is NeoGov. It's not in my budget. It's in IT's budget, but uh, that is the simple ask that I have for this year. All right. You, thank you, Director right. Baller. Thank you. Uh, next up, um, <clears throat> Parks and Recreation. Thank you. Uh, Clerk Prasher is passing out our capital request, which is out of our 5,600. So that will be the last um, item that I touch on. So um, in our 5,200s, which is our supplies, you will see an increase in 5,209. That is our chemicals line item. That is where we buy our grass seed, our chemicals, our fertilizer, pesticides, so forth. Um, grass seed is expected to go up by 50% this year. That's what we're being told. So we're hoping to be able to purchase that sooner rather than later. Uh, we don't want to have to incur that cost. Also, our fertilizer, that's going up between 10 and 15% as well. We need to get a jump on that as we did have an attack of armyworms this fall, and they... Uh, had a fun time out there at Civic Park. So we've got to make sure we have that on hand, um, that pesticide on hand in case they come back again, plus grass seeds. We need to redo that. Um, 5215, our recreation supplies, you do see an increase there as there's an increase in uniforms. Um, we've added some new nature series, so we need to get uh, supplies for that. Safety Town, we're going to bring back the bike safety to Safety Town, and so we'd like to buy some um, tricycles, trikes for the kids to use so they don't have to worry about bringing their own bikes, and a lot of our kids don't have bikes, so we'll already have those there. Um, new bases and bats for baseball and softball. Uh, 5259, which is our operating supplies, you'll see a substantial increase there, but we need to um, replace some catch basins out at Huber and JFK Park and some trash cans um, with lids. We lost several of them in the flood that we had in August. Also, additional dog waste stations. We've also applied for a grant with Swaco to increase our recycling needs, and so that comes with a match, and so our match on that, if, we, if approved, I shall say when approved, is about $5,000, and so that will go for purchasing um, recycling containers for here inside City Hall. We do very little, I'm ashamed to say, recycling here, and so everybody will have recycling at their desk, and then we'll have recycling containers in the hallway, upstairs in the break room, also at the Senior Center, and then to purchase additional recycling uh, trash canisters for, for the parks. Uh, 5,300 are services. Um, pretty much, it, we had pretty much a, they went down overall except for our last one, which is other miscellaneous services in 5,399. So what we did this year with our baseball and softball program and our soccer program is to remain, um, to keep it going, to uh, we're, our team numbers are struggling in some of our divisions where we may only get four kids in a, or four teams in a 14U. This affords us the ability we're joining with other communities around us and we have association fees that we have to pay. So that's what comes out of that um, 5399 So the 5600 is our capital purchases. purchases. Um, 
A couple of these are replacements, a few are new. The first one that you're looking at is our water trailer. Uh, we built that water trailer in-house 15 years ago, so it's time for a new water trailer. Um, so the price is there. We, we've done a lot of tweaks and duct tape and fixing it along the way, and we just can't. We just can't nurse it anymore. So we really need a new water trailer. That's what's used for watering the baskets along Main Street um, and any new tree plantings that are in the park. And sometimes when contractors or developers, they come in and they do work in the parks or along the streets, they may come back, forget to come back and fill those water bags. And so we go out and we fill those bags. Um, and, and so we would really appreciate a new water trailer. The second page item there uh, that you're looking at is a, a piece of new equipment that we're asking for. It's a lawn and landscape fertilizer and seed sprayer. Uh, this will ha help us to apply uh, lawn applications to turf areas that are difficult to access with our larger machine. So this is something a little smaller that we could utilize. We do contract out some areas around here at City Hall, and with a smaller piece of equipment, we'd be able to get on there and do more precise sprayings and spreadings. We won't have all that overflow. Uh, the next one is a replacement John Deere. Um, John Deere is expensive. Uh, the last one that we purchased was in 2001, and so this would be replacing that one. It's time for that one to go. It's the seat, the sunshade, uh, several of the front axle components are in need of replacement due to the age. The engine does smoke at times if it's run at a high speed because of the high number of hours that it has. And um, we utilize this piece of equipment to operate our cedar, or we would use it for the cedar fertilizer and spreader. Uh, we can also put a brush cutter on there and a tow-behind rotary mower. Um, adding the cab would allow us to... Um, you know, have it be enclosed, and um, it's similar to the one we purchased in 2018, which replaced the one we had from 1985. Um, the next one is a replacement. It's an infield groomer. This is what we use to drag the baseball diamonds with um, and getting them prepped for the games after a rain. We have to have to mow them there. So there's some information on that. Uh, the last one would be a new piece of equipment that we would purchase, and um, this would have... Um, the ability to, to mow slopes, so like the ditch at Civic Park, we could mow that. Uh, rather than having to hand mow it or hand weed whack it, we'd take that. So this would be able to do that. It would also have a rotary broom on it that would help us clean up parking lots and the trails. It would probably be too wide for the sidewalks down Main Street, but we can take a look at those dimensions. Uh, when we had the last flood in August, it took us over a week and a half to get the trails and the parking lots cleaned up from all the silt and um, gravel and so forth, the debris that was left behind. So that is our request for 2022. Any questions? With the replacement um, equipment, what are we going to do with the old? Equipment? We either we put it on gov deals, and if um, so, for some of it we can trade in, um, and some of it we'll put on gov deals. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, Chief Baker. Hoping everybody would be asleep by now, but uh, we're still awake. Uh, we do have some increases in personnel. The, the most exciting uh, increase is the hopeful addition of a second social worker. Uh, if you've been following uh, any of the stuff we've been putting out about the social worker, the program's really been going great. Uh, we've seen a reduction in repeat calls from certain individuals. Uh, and I'm seeing great value in that program. We want to continue to look at how that program progresses into 2022. And if it continues on the path that we're currently at, we want to look into adding a, a second social worker. For, so that would be an uh, additional position. If you go down to uh, 5,200 supplies, um, we're pretty consistent with 2021. And if you remember, uh, 2021 was pretty consistent with 2020 because we were in pandemic. Uh, we did ask for an increase in fuel, and I know this goes against our hybrid uh, program. Uh, fuel costs uh, are really scaring me right now, and so we did budget for a little bit more in fuel, and that's where you'll see that increase in 5200, uh, but there's no other increase in any of the other categories. Um, just for the record, we use about uh, 11000 to $12,000 a month in fuel. Uh, so as we transition to hybrid, we're hoping that'll help that. I don't think it'll ever go down, maybe. 
uh, but we're hoping that'll help that cost uh, as we move forward and transition to hybrids. Uh, 5300, uh, which is our services, you'll see uh, that actually uh, went down a little bit. Um, 5600 is our capital uh, purchases. Most of uh, what is in that category is the vehicles. So uh, we are requesting four cruisers, which we put an ordinance in front of you tonight. Uh, we will also be seeking to uh, add a motorcycle, and it'll really be a replacement. So currently we have uh, four motorcycles. One of those motorcycles is for training purposes only. It's not uh, road worthy. If you know anything about uh, motorcycle training, they wreck those motorcycles a lot. So we put one motorcycle uh, to the side for training, and it gets pretty tore up uh, in training. That's to prevent our, our good road worthy motorcycles from getting uh, torn up. One of our motorcycles was also an old Ohio State Highway Patrol motorcycle. It's our third motorcycle. Um, it is currently in service right now. We have two uh, full-time motorcycle officers. Uh, we just trained a third, which will be starting uh, in January. Um, we have a fourth that does it as an extra duty. Uh, we, we are looking to lose one of our motorcycle off officers in February. Uh, Officer Triplett will be retiring after 25 years of service and moving into full-time pastoring. Uh, and then we also have a sergeant in there that's due to retire in a year and a half. Um, so we do have three additional motorcycle uh, officers trained, uh, so they will be ready to move into those positions. Uh, those bikes are very important. Um, as you probably hear, uh, our biggest complaint is traffic complaints. Um, our motorcycles are the most effective unit in addressing uh, traffic complaints. So most people, if they're driving down the road, they can see a cruiser if it's sitting there running radar or, or laser. Uh, they have a little more difficulty picking up the motorcycle. So we don't want to uh, lose that program. We want to keep that program in place. And uh, we, we need the equipment to keep that in place. So not very exciting for us. I wish I had more than, than fuel costs in a, in a motorcycle. But that's essentially uh, where our increases are coming from or our request. Uh, I, I do want to go on the record and say uh, we've heard a lot throughout the, the past year and a half about uh, supporting police and funding police. And uh, I want to say that I appreciate the, the support here in Reynoldsburg that our police department receives uh, both from city staff and elected officials. Uh, it shouldn't go unnoticed. Sometimes I read things on the Internet about uh, not supporting the police. Uh, we are supported here in Reynoldsburg, both by the community, elected officials, and city administration. And I, I want to know, uh, I want you to know that that, that does not go unnoticed. Uh, I am very grateful uh, for your support, and hopefully we, we continue to, to have the support of council. So thank you. So, um, Deputy, I mean, Chief, oh, I'm sleepy. Demoted already. <laughs> <laughs> After all those nice words, you just got a demotion. That's what I'm Sorry about that. Um, so again, I appreciate everything that our officers are doing um, in our city. Um, I think I asked, asked you this question probably a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, as our city is growing, right, um, I believe we're over 41,000 or so, do we feel like we are where we need to be regarding our police officers? Do we need any more that we need to make sure that we, making sure that, you know, Reynoldsburg is staying safe? Yeah, that's a great question. So there, there's multiple things we look at when we determine staffing levels. Uh, the short answer right now is I believe uh, we are staffed appropriately. Um, as we grow, uh, the mayor has talked to me um, recently about doing staffing studies, and that is something we should do every couple years to determine um, we are meeting the community's expectations. So um, we always look at that. I just recently had a sergeant that uh, asked about our staffing, if we should increase minimum staffing and, and things of that nature. So real quick, one of, the, one of the metrics we use is response time. And uh, I want to make sure when somebody calls a police officer in, here in, in Reynoldsburg, you have a cop there within five minutes. That's kind of the standard for me that I think is acceptable in our community. That's not saying if it's a higher priority call, you may get one there in two minutes. Uh, but we are still under five minutes uh, on our response times. Uh, I believe the dispatch did an article today about Columbus response times, and uh, not uh, this isn't a reflection of the Columbus Police Department. It's a reflection of the staffing at the Columbus Police Department. And for their, their uh, part one crimes, which is the most serious crimes, 
uh, it's over 10 minutes for to get a police officer. So imagine uh, somebody holding a gun to you and somebody calls 911, and you'll probably on average get a cop there in 11 minutes. Uh, that's not the case here. Uh, and that's because we, we are staffed appropriately, but, but that is something we should always look at. We should make sure that we're meeting community expectations. And when we start hearing from the community that uh, when I call uh, 911, they're putting me on hold, or I haven't seen a police officer in 10 minutes, then we need to start looking at what we should be doing to change either how we're staffing our agency or the number of, of staff that we have. But right now, I think we're good. Um, it's a difficult time to hire police officers because of what's going on in the country. Our numbers are down as far as uh, applicants. Uh, but we've still been getting uh, highly qualified applicants. Uh, but it's, it's hard. Uh, as you know, the hiring process, when you lose an officer, it takes a year to get an officer to replace that officer because of training and, and things of that nature. So right now, we're at 65. We are trying to get closer to the 70, which is authorized by, by ordinance. Um, I don't know if we'll ever get there, to be honest with you, but, but we want to try to get close. And uh, for now, I think that's um, appropriate for, the, for what we have in the community and where we are as far as growth. But that is something we should always look at. Thank you, Chief. Yep. Chief. Appreciate it. Promote it again. Thank you. I would just like to, um, Captain. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Two levels. <laughs> But I do appreciate you and everything that the uh, RPD has done. I've said it before, and I'll just go ahead and say it again. It is very noticeable about the customer service that your department has given to this community, and not a lot of other communities can say that. So I like to think, you know, not think, I know that we're setting the standard here uh, between um, police and community relations that, I think other communities can envy and take and modify for them because I'm not blind to the world, what's going on in the world. You're not, everybody in this room's not. But we show that what can happen when community and police department work together and not against each other. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. You're excused, General. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Four stars. Director Bauman, did you have another comment that you wanted? Just one thing. Uh, I'm not the chief. I'm sorry. Um, the Capitol listened to Capitol Hill. They listened to the 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 so again, uh, Chair Salvati, members of uh, Council, um, obviously, you know, there's a there's a lot of information that you have been presented with to go through. Uh, I do uh, respectfully ask that if you have questions or concerns about any part of the budget, to feel free and reach out to myself and the directors. Uh, obviously, uh, if changes need to be made in certain areas or you have more qualifying questions or more something specific that we can get to in advance of our next meeting, uh, please let us know so we can have that information ready to go. Uh, and with that, I turn it back to Chair Salvati. All right, are there any additional questions that haven't been asked from anybody on council to anybody that presented? All right. I'm going to go ahead and move that this ordinance, uh, that I, I'm going to move we forward this ordinance to council for its first reading. Do I have a second? Second. Second by council member Strickland. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion carries. This ordinance will be forwarded to council for its first reading. As there is no further business with the Finance and Administration Committee, I return the meeting to me. <laughs> all right, item 11. Boy, it's been a long meeting. Uh, item 11 is the consent agen agenda for emergency adoption. Items 11A and B are part of the consent agenda. These ordinances stand for emergency adoption unless someone wants to remove an item for further discussion. Council will move, Council will move forward for emergency approval. Okay. All right, would the clerk please read items 11A and B? 
A, an ordinance unappropriating funds from an account in the computer department and appropriating funds to another account in the computer department and declaring an emergency. B, an ordinance to certify nuisance abatement, abatement costs associated with 54 Scenic Road in the city of Reynoldsburg and declaring an emergency. All right, may I have a motion to approve these ordinances? So moved. Moved by Councilmember Baker. May I have a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Peckrell. Um, would the clerk please read the rule or <laughs> call the roll? Councilmember Peckerell? Yes. Councilmember Lawson Rowe? Aye. Councilmember Kotner? Aye. Councilmember Baker? Aye. Councilmember Strickland? Aye. And President Acting President Silvani. Aye. That is a six zero vote. Item 12 is consent agenda for first reading. Items 12A through V are part of the consent agenda. These ordinances stand for a first reading unless someone wants to remove an item for further discussion. Council will move forward for the first reading. All right, would the clerk please read items 12A through V. Do I have to? <laughs> Item A, an ordinance making a transfer of funds in the Parks and Recreation Department among various general fund accounts and declaring an emergency. B, an ordinance making a transfer of funds in the Parks and Recreation Department among various general funds accounts in the Senior Center declaring an emergency. An ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into a contract with OHM for architectural and engineering design and bidding services for improvements to Civic Park and appropriating funds therefor. D, an ordinance unappropriating funds from the account in the maintenance department and appropriating funds to the account in the police department. E, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to purchase four hybrid police cruisers and related equipment for the Reynoldsburg Police Department. F, an ordinance to amend Chapter 351, Parking of the Codification Ordinances for the City of Reynoldsburg. G, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into a contract with Southeastern Equipment Company to purchase a 2022 VACAL AJVR 1015 Hydro VAC Jet Combination Equipment, Wave Competitive Bidding and Appropriating Funds. H, an ordinance to amend Chapter 953 Water Charges, Section 953.01A Water Rate Schedule of the Code of Ordinances for the City of Reynoldsburg and Declaring Emergency. I, an ordinance to amend Chapter 945 Sewer Charges, Section 945.02C Rate Schedule for the Code of Ordinances for the City of Reynoldsburg, Ohio, declaring an emergency. J, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into an intergovernmental working agreement with Franklin Soil and Water Conservation District to support the Big Walnut Watershed Coordination Program administered by, administered by the Franklin Soil and Water Conservation District in coordination and support from Morpsey and the state watershed programs with ODNR and Ohio EPA. K, an ordinance to repeal chapter 1305, sections 130501, section 130502, section 130503, and replace with section 130501. And remember, renumber sections 130504 through 130512 inclusive of the codified ordinances of the city of Reynoldsburg. L, an ordinance to authorize the mayor to enter into a development agreement with the Center Ice Foundation of Central Ohio for the purpose of future sale and redevelopment of real estate and declaring an emergency. M, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into a letter of intent with Damler Group for future sale and commercial, commercial development of land owned by the city of Reynoldsburg. In an ordinance to authorize the mayor to enter into a contract with governmentjobs.com for new gov software, appropriate funds, and declaring an emergency. O, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into a contract for the city of Reynoldsburg's health insurance coverage with Medical Mutual of Ohio for the period from January 1st, 2022 through December 31st, 2023, and declaring an emergency. 
P, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into agreement with the Kirsch Group Technologies, LLC, for information technology services for the period of January 1st, 2021, I'm sorry, 2022 through December 31st, 2022, waive competitive bidding and declaring an emergency. Q, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to execute a renewal contract with Mutual of Omaha for employee life, accidental death, and dismemberment, short-term disability, and long-term disability insurance for the period of January 1st, 2022 through December 31st, 2022, and declaring an emergency are an ordinance to amend the personnel procedure manual regarding employee conduct, hours of work, overtime, call and pay, and vacation leave, and declaring an emergency. S, an ordinance to amend chapter 160, section 160.02A, authorized positions, personnel classification and pay grade, A, administration, E, parks and recreation department, F, police department, and G2, service department, building division, section 160.03B, supervisory pay range, C, senior police management, D, seasonal employee, 1, parks, and recreation, two, service department, three, street department, E, occasional labor independent contract, section 160.044, tomato festival event staffing compensation, section 160.05, overtime eligibility, section 160.07, longevity, and section 160.12, city clothing provided senior police management for the city of Reynoldsburg and declaring an emergency. T, an ordinance authorizing the city auditor to fund health savings accounts for 2022 and declaring an emergency. U, an ordinance to transfer funds among various general fund accounts for the year-end cleanup and declaring an emergency. And V, an ordinance to make appropriations for expenses and other ex expenditures of the City of Reynoldsburg, State of Ohio, during the fiscal year ending December 31st, 2022. All right, take a breath. I'll read slow. These ordinances stand for a first reading. Uh, 13, item 13 is consent agenda for a second reading. Items 13A through C are part of a consent agenda. These ordinances stand for a second reading unless someone wants to remove an item for further discussion. Council will move forward with the second reading. All right. Would the clerk please read items 13A through C? A, an ordinance to amend the official, official zoning map for the city of Reynoldsburg for a property located at 8555 East Main Street from Innovation District I to Community Commercial District CC. B, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into a contract with the District Advisory Council of the Franklin County General Health District and Franklin County Public Health for Health Services. C, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into an agreement with the Media Promotion Enterprises, PM, MPE, for the 2022 Tomato Festival and declaring an emergency. <clears throat> These ordinances stand for a second reading. Item 14 is consent agenda for a third reading. Items 14A through C are part of the consent agenda. These ordinances stand for a third reading and approval. Unless someone wants to remove an item for further discussion, council will move forward with a vote on these ordinances. Would the clerk please read items 14A through C. A, an ordinance to amend Chapter 958 Stormwater Charges, Section 958.06, Equivalent Residential Unit, ERU, of the City of Reynoldsburg, Ohio, Codified Ordinances. B, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to establish a process and eligibility requirements for a grant program directed toward female, minority, and veteran-owned new businesses in the City of Reynoldsburg and appropriating funds. And C, an ordinance authorizing local aggregation of retail electric loads in accordance with section 4928.20 of the Ohio Revised Code. May I have a motion to approve these ordinances? So moved. Moved by Councilman Baker. May I have a second? Second. Second by Councilman Packrell. Uh, would the clerk please read the roll? Councilmember Pecorell? 
Yes. Council Member Lawson Rowe? Aye. Council Member Kotner? Aye. Council Member Baker? Aye. Council Member Strickland? Aye. Acting President Savati? Aye. That was a 6 0 vote. <clears throat> All right, item 15 is other council matters. Does anyone on council have any further items that they would like to discuss? No one's looking at you. <laughs> council member Baker. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Just real quick, everybody, um, logistics, those who work in the retail, those who work um, are men and women in military, and law enforcement firefighters, thank you. We're still in pandemic, so I'm still going to thank you. Even after the pandemic, I'm still going to thank you. <laughs> Any other comments? No. All right, 15, or I mean uh, 16 is upcoming meetings. There is a schedule for upcoming council, BZBA, and planning commission meetings on the agenda. Council's next meeting is Monday, November 22nd at 6.30 p.m. Please note the council meetings in December will be the 6th and the 13th at 6.30 p.m. The December 27th council meeting has been canceled. Unless there is additional business, this meeting stands adjourned at 9.57. Hey, Mayor, at least you could go home and watch the Bears lose.